Blackjack with Griffin and David Blackjack with Griffin and David Don't know what to say or to expect All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blackjack Dr. Brown, I brought this podcast back from the future and, and now it's erased. Of course it's erased. It means your podcast hasn't been written yet. Oh. No one's has. Your podcast is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. Both of you. Yeah, that's nice. This is the last line of the movie, basically. Right? I love your uh, blase O. Oh. To what? Oh, wait, when, uh, in response? I, I was trying to remember. I was trying to place what this was going to be. And then I was very satisfied. You were, you sounded uh, mildly satisfied. You went, oh. oh. Well, no, but I was, like, oh. I was like an oh, you know? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then he says, we will, Doc. Yeah. Right. Then Marty butts in. Shut up, Marty. It's, this is Doc's movie. Let him have the last line. This really is Doc's movie. I mean, that's the thing I really admire about this one. Like putting this under a microscope for this episode. Now that we've spent a month living in Hill Valley, as it were. Mm. Right. Yes. We had our Roger Rabbit episode, but we have spent a month really thinking about this franchise. The value of this movie mostly lies in. Let's give Doc Brown a movie. Um, yeah. Okay. So we should introduce the podcast and we should, you know, talk to our great guests and all that. And I think you might know this already or you might have anticipated this. But yet this movie, I vastly prefer to part two. This movie's great. That is so wild. This movie's really that the, good. That is the most David opinion. Is it? Is it really? Okay. Okay. I kind of was watching it and I was like, how is that not the opinion? Yeah, I mean, I feel like... The opinion. I know, I know I'm know. i not I know I'm not on alone in an island. I'm sure people agree with me, but... I, I feel like Back to the Future franchise heads are like, I just love this series. I feel like most people feel like this movie's a shrug. They're like, oh, it like kind of sucks, right? I mean, I guess it's fun, but whatever. And then I've always contended it's like the ultimate Gentleman's Six movie. It's just like well-made, charming, good performance. It's like a Gentleman's Eight. Eight and a half. Wow. Uh, to our guest, who, of course, you're invited to speak at any time. Uh, D- David David has been reticent to show Back to the Future Part 2 the respect that I believe it deserves. I, I So I meant to rewatch the whole series before sure. we talked. Mm-hmm. And I, I only was able to watch the third one. And I listened to your podcast about Back to the Future 1. But because of the space-time continuum, the podcast about sure. Back to the Future Part 2 has not yet been released at the time of this recording. It has not yet been released and you haven't heard it. And then you'll then hear it and then this episode will change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. it will. The file will update. <laughs> There's, it's going to change my tombstone weirdly. <laughs> like the reason Absolutely. I die will change. <laughs> and it'll change my tombstone pizza. I bought a pepperoni. It's going to turn to a supreme. Uh, have you ever found a garden? Garlic bread, Griff? You no, I've been searching those? so actively. Do you know that these exist, Josh? That they're... I'm half introducing you now. <laughs> there are... There's a line of tombstone pizzas now, the main flavor varietals, but the crust is coated in garlic. It's a garlic <laughs> bread awesome. crust. It sounds, it sounds so, so good. fucking good. And it's all I want. And we, we wanted to get them before we went on Doughboys to review Tombstone. <laughs> and David... I mean, David, I feel like you looked in like three places and I looked in like... 25 places you were in manhattan and i don't have a car too. well but manhattan, manhattan manhattan has a lot of variety with supermarkets yes. whereas brooklyn less so i looked where i could i also though would look on like instacart or whatever i was uh, i was always trying Same to here. see if any supermarket in like 25 miles had one i looked everywhere for them and then tombstone slid into my dms and they were like when this is all over we'll try to send you one when this is all over <laughs> Oh yes. <laughs> wait! So that's that's I thought your... there was like a history you had with Tombstone. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe it is. Yeah, so it is, was a little ominous. Is Griffin, that why when this feeling isn't so raw anymore with me, <laughs> yeah. the Tombstone social media manager? When I come to peace with you, so you you want a vaccine simply so that you can then reply to Tombstone and be like, "So where's my garlic is bread a- pizza?" That's not why I want a vaccine. Eh. Is it a top three reason? <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I also think the vaccine would be better covered in garlic. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. 
wait a second. What if it turns out that the garlic bread pizza is the vaccine? Right. And that's that's, that's why the shortage. The, there's all these supply chain issues. <laughs> like that's right. the problem. Because right. they can't figure out like who has antibodies, who doesn't. Why do some young people get hit hard and old people survive? And it's just like they could map it to like the four stores that are selling garlic bread pizza. That is that is one of the little New York City as somebody who grew up not in New York City. That is sure. one of the New York things where sometimes you want something that is like that feels so basic that like everyone else in the country would have. And it will take yes. you like it's like a three day charting like, OK, I got to take this subway to this one part of of Brooklyn. No. And I I grew up here. I'm born and raised in New York. But like when my family would go travel to other places or we'd like visit other people in different states, then I'd fall in love with some like regional junk food item. Mm -hmm. Or, or a specific flavor that I'd never seen in New York or like fast food chains mm -hmm. that don't exist in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I would just go crazy uh, longing for them. But this, of course, is a podcast about film yeah, actors, directors <laughs> who have massive success early on in their careers. And they're given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce. Baby! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, at the last second, I was like, I should I should put some Back to the Future spin on it. It's a miniseries on the films of Robert Zemeckis. It's called Podcast Away. And now we're finishing out the trilogy. We're talking Back to the Future, part three. And our guest, one of the nicest people in the world. The nicest man on the internet. Can I say that? The nicest man on the internet? That's very flattering. Thank you. What if what if you had demanded that we say you're the internet's bad boy though? What if you were like I'm rebranding? <laughs> or you know what would be even more messed up is if I demanded that Griffin say I was the nicest man on the internet. You better and say he, I'm nice. And that he asked me as if it was his idea. <laughs> yes, and then you corrected my wording. Uh, he's a great stand-up. Uh, he's written for last week tonight. Currently a writer on Jesus and Marrow. Uh, Josh Gondelman. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this has been a long journey. We've been talking for a long time. <laughs> has been a long about journey. About getting you on some episode because you're a listener and a wonderful person. Uh, and uh, we've absolutely abused your <laughs> kindness in terms of constantly going like, oh, this thing came up. Would you be mine if we swapped you to this episode? I do think it was. it's no problem at all. And I, uh, you, you guys have your own the schedule and that makes so much sense. But it did... It was kind of a Back to the Future esque, uh, absolutely span of space and time. <laughs> yeah, right. But we yeah. did right. it. We're here. We're here. At one point, you were going to be on a later episode. At yep. one point, you were going to be on an earlier mm -hmm. episode. You yeah. moved around the timeline. Yep. That's. But you know what? I feel. I feel that it turned out exactly the way it should. Back to the Future Part Three. It's the podcast is is what we make of it. That's what we're here for, baby. So what? Now that we know David's opinion. And and my opinion is, you know, massive fan of this franchise. I think it goes one, two, three. But I think the drop from two to three is bigger than the drop from one to two, even though one is inarguably like the perfect movie in the franchise. What is your relationship to this franchise at large and this movie in particular? I think I saw them out of order, but mm. came to wow. the opinion that you have, Griffin. I think I saw okay. two first. Like I, I saw it at a at like a friend's house. Like we were there, fr family friends. We were there for Passover, and I was like, "Man, this Biff Tannen, a powerful man, and probably always was such." <laughs> and and then I saw back, and then I think my dad was like, "Well, you should you should watch the first one." And I was like, "There's a Back to the Future one." <laughs> like I was that <laughs> young and credulous. And yeah. then I watched. Yeah. Then I watched three. Yeah. So I'm way out of order. And I remember one being like uh, the classic film. Two being mm. its own thing in the same world, also very good, but like in a a more overall ominous feel end to end. Mm, mm, Not that there mm. wasn't peril in the first one, but uh, like no, you know, two is very, dark. But yeah, yeah I sure. just feel like visually, I remember it being darker. Yeah, and, and just like the theme of like the whole world is already screwed up on this timeline was like a new thing to introduce. And then, um, and then I saw three, and three is like fun. I remember it be feeling like the third one of a movie, uh, of a of a series of movies, is when you just go way back in time because this whole Ninja Turtles <laughs> three came out, yeah, like in the early nineties. Yeah, the and turtles they went to, like, were in time. We all ancient, know this. China, ancient uh, sure. Japan, maybe. I'm Japan. now. I need to. It's definitely. I think it had like a sort of a samurai 
feel, yeah, but now I want to you know check it out. Well, you sound, yes, yes, yeah, it's yes. feudal, feudal Japan. Turtles feudal in Japan. Japan. Feudal Japan. I feel bad for messing that up. I don't think I'm a bad person for doing that. You're not a bad but person, I but I do want to give you the tagline for Turtles in Time now that Please. Uh, I've looked it up. Griffin, do you know it? Do you know the tagline for Turtles in Time? <sighs> I don't. What is it? Ancient Japan. Okay. Period. 1593. <laughs> period. Okay. Without a map. Period. Cowabunga? Without a clue. Period. Oh. Mm-hmm. Without a pizza. Period. <laughs> This, wow, I forgot that the stakes were so high in the third Ninja Turtles movie. Of course, it's impossible I, for them to get some good za. I get that they don't have Japan. a map, but like, is that like that's not really their biggest concern? It, it's not like they're like, oh no, we went back in time and we don't have a map. Like, I would have like, left <laughs> out if I had to cut one. If I was making edits and I had to lose just yeah. a couple words for space, I mm-hmm. would lose without a clue. I, when I, I was going to say, when I think of the Ninja Turtles, <laughs> right. I don't think of them as specifically clueless or more clueless than, say, you or I would be if we appeared in feudal Japan. They're pretty competent characters. They're not Bill and Ted. Like, that's a Bill and Ted tagline. Yes, absolutely. It's a Bill and Ted, like, without a clue, where they're just like, dude, are we in feudal Japan? And, and that's, <laughs> right. like, the whole vibe. I feel like Ninja Turtles are pretty known for rolling with the punches and like yeah, very adaptable. thinking on their feet. Yes. Well, they've studied martial arts. Do you, yeah. do you think it's that they're like, it's like they're without a clue because they're without a map? Like, is it trying to like underline <laughs> that like since they're mapless, the clues yeah, but are since gone? These guys like fucking cartographers. Like, I don't remember. <laughs> That being like, you know, Donatello having to check his compass every five minutes before they attack the foot. What is this shit? It's just a weird, It like the movie should, because it has a below tagline as well, which is the turtles are back in time. Sure. And that's really all you need. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's the premise of the movie. We get it. Like, I don't, I don't need it to sound like a rom-com where it's like they're without a map and like they've lost a compass. Like, you know, like, I, I don't And they're that. playing by heart. Those right. Turtles. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I what I like about um, without a pizza is it just makes them sound like shitty American tourists, like mm-hmm. showing up in Japan, being like, "Is there a fucking Domino's around here or what?" Yeah. Yes, right, right. But there's no pizza. Feudal Japan sucks. I initially thought it was great. It is funny how like now that the Ninja Turtles has been around for so long, rebooted so many times, and lasted for generations, and people like care about. Ninja Turtles mm-hmm. and like the mythology and the integrity of the characters across interpretations and stuff. When you go like, right, it was literally just a Frank Miller Daredevil parody. Right. And the foot soldiers are called the foot soldiers because of in the Daredevil hand. they're the right. hand ninjas. Yes. And Splinter's called Splinter because in Daredevil his name is Stick. Like everything is just like a space balls joke. And yep. it's like if Dark <laughs> Helmet had developed as much integrity as Darth Vader. Well, and we were like, well, we all know originally in the timeline Dark Helmet. It's, yeah, not yeah, just, yeah, yeah. it's not just that, though, Griffin. It's like you're right that it's initially a parody. And then essentially yeah. they are approached by cartoon companies, toy makers, Happy Meal, you know, manufacturers, anyone. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, whatever. Give us money. Like they had no integrity about the no. brand. They were like, yeah, do whatever you want with it. Well, <laughs> just, you know, go ahead. Sorry. I, I'm not, I'm not, there was I'm a not big... criticizing them. I think they I, did oh, a no, great I, job. Please, like, you think I'm criticizing them. Uh, I, I always forget which one is which, but there was a big falling out between Eastman and Laird, and one of them was like, I now see we've let things sure. go too far. Like, had the Albert Einstein, like, we had to create the atomic bomb so that it could never be used ever again mm-hmm. kind of thing. Right. And he, like, sold out his part of it and was just like, I don't approve of any of this. And the other guy cashes the checks and every time is like, this is the best version yet. <laughs> so one of right. them has had, right. like, this sort of lingering I, it's, regret. It's the, Eastman has just stuck with it and is like, you know, did yes. cameos in the Michael Bay produced remakes or whatever. Right. And Laird moved to Massachusetts and I guess just hangs out. <laughs> the other thing, and I know this because the Tick arc was so similar to this, uh, like Tick only became what it became because everyone was like, fuck, what's the next Ninja Turtles? Take any black and white independent comic book with a slightly right. subversive edge and see if we can make it happen. Um, 
it was the toy deal first. It was a guy came to them and was like, I can absolutely sell toys. Then they made every single march, uh, merchandising deal. And then they went, look at all this merch we have. Someone should make a cartoon show. So it was essentially like an, a, an indie black and white comic book that was somewhat hard to find that then got all of these merchandising deals. And then someone said, oh, we should find a way to make it accessible to children. It's so like, why, bizarre. Why should kids want this tick toy? You know how... Because the the toy comes from the toy first comes from the premise of like you know how kids love ticks right <laughs> right right <laughs> covered in but them. the tick was the the tick was the same thing they had done like five <laughs> issues and then the toy company was like we look at what just happened with Ninja Turtles we could do this too so there's the weird thing where all the early tick merchandise that came out when the cartoon show came out has shit that's not in the cartoon show. Like, the video game has characters that are only in the comics, and the toy line has characters that never appear. Like, they just were like, everyone was, like, it was complete uh, cart before the horse shit. Uh, Back to the Future, quite the opposite. We talked about this in our Back to the Future 2 episode, but this was like the tail end of creatives getting such control over their property and their creations, where, like, Gail and Zemeckis have absolute control and kill rights over everything back to the future until they die wow. it's one of those things where it's like it can never be remade they can never do some crappy spinoff without them right like they just have the ultimate and all be all say and it does make this movie kind of unique that it's mm-hmm. like here is a major 80s franchise that has its third installment come out in 1990 and there has never really been serious talk of doing anything major again mm-hmm. you have comic books and you have video games and you have an animated series and you have stuff that's all treated it is like out of canon silliness that Bob Gale himself oversees and like stamps off on or helps write. But this is this one franchise that's kind of been like beautifully locked in ember, you know, without mm-hmm. this threat of it being revived. Uh, Ghostbusters was a similar one where like Ramus, Aykroyd, Reitman, Murray all had complete kill rights. Nothing could go forward without all four of them approving. And Murray was always the holdup. And the other guys wanted to do stuff. And then when Ramus died and it was only three of them, no one's ever really written about this. But Mm. there was some deal negotiated with Bill Murray, I think because they had him at Ramus's memorial service. And they were like, can we just write you a check and you'll let us make stuff without you? They've always said, you want to get to Bill Murray, you get him at a funeral, he's putty in your hands. (laughs) Right. But it's this wild thing. People were like, why does ba- uh, Ghostbusters 3 not get made? Why don't they just make it without him if he doesn't want to make it? Yeah. And it was like, they couldn't make it unless he gave them permission to make it. And he gave so little of a shit that he wouldn't even say, I don't care, just make it without me. Which is so funny because Bill Murray had that period where he famously did anything, like was borderline right. tricked into doing Garfield. <laughs> right. 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 It's it's so bizarre. But He's like, like the, I can't wait to work with the Coen brothers. And they were like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> Truly one of the amazing <laughs> stories of how a thing got made. It's right, so that bizarre. they gaslit him into believing <laughs> that that's what was happening. But I don't think they gaslit him. I think he just asked no follow-up questions and did the most cursory read. I mean, I think he's even admitted he didn't read the script until he showed up in the recording studio. He just saw the cover page and said, man, I really like those Coens. How much would it rule if now, as a lark, the Coen brothers made a Garfield movie? Right. They should do it. They should take it over. But in canon. It should be a sequel to Tale of Two Kitties. Yeah, 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 yeah. Full continuity. The (laughs) other Garfield thing that this is like maybe apocryphal, but it came to mind because you were talking about how they they own the rights so so outright. Yeah. Is that when Jim when Garfield when those uh the Garfield suction cup things and the the rear Mm -hmm. windshield of cars were really big, Jim Davis saw them getting too popular and demanded they be pulled from the market because he he was worried that Garfield was like jumping the shark and people were going to be sick of it. Wow. And then of course that you never know, happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, Garfield but to be, to run be fair, <laughs> He was kind of right. Like Garfield still fucking exists and makes like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Like what did Garfield do today? Now I'm looking it up. <laughs> I'll tell Okay, so it's a Monday, so he's not happy. He's pissed, David. <laughs> uh oh. This is uh, you're right. not getting Garfield all at right. his best today. I'm gonna read you I'm gonna read you the Garfield comic from today. I'm gonna it's three panels. Okay. Panel okay. one, uh, Garfield classic. is looking straight at us. He's got a crazy oh, no. grin on his face, and he's okay. thinking 
because he doesn't speak. He just thinks, right? He's Thought bubble. Stuck, yeah. stuck in the middle with you is playing. <laughs> right. And he's thinking, yes. ready to train? And then the second panel is basically the exact same picture, except he's holding his hand up, his paw. And he says, uh-huh. let's start with some sustained breathing exercises. Okay, guys. Okay. Panel three is okay. coming up. Hard cut. Garfield is asleep. He's on his back. And the only thing he's saying is the letter Z. Do you get it? The, the breathing exercises are snoring because he's asleep. I've got three words for you about Garfield. Still got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think I can honestly say Garfield has not lost any edge. That is yep. exactly as funny as Garfield He's was still 40 got his years ago. I, I mean, I swear to God, the whole thing, like, I know people mock it, but, like, I looked at the Sunday <laughs> panel. Every single panel is the same. Like, he just doesn't even yes. bother. It's literally just John looking at Odie and occasionally drinking coffee until Garfield comes in, like, panel eight to do a joke. <laughs> it, like, it's, it's crazy. That's actually- it's kind of the masterful thing about Garfield is that yes. it's called Garfield, but you don't see the Garfield until the eighth panel. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I assume both of you uh, uh, saw Garfield minus Garfield yes. when that was a big deal on Wonderful. the Internet. And it, it was kind of incredible for the, for listeners who don't know. It was this like early blog phenomenon. Right, that's early like Tumblr, just, right. Mm-hmm. Right. Someone would take Garfield strips and then just remove Garfield from the strip. So they pretty much just be comics of John Arbuckle talking to himself about his loneliness. Yeah. Which, of course, because Garfield doesn't speak, that was always what was happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's the, right. the strips trick you into thinking there's a conversation. The subtext of John's life laid bare yes. by the absence of Garfield, though, is really tragic. It was incredible. It became like this, like, Dan Klaus-esque, like, really brutal, <laughs> like, head-on exploration into depression. And uh, and Jim Davis, like, fully approved of it. And they published a book that of, rules. like, the Garfield minus Garfield strips that Jim Davis was like, yeah, this is great. This is the best my comics have ever been. (laughs) Jim Davis seems like he rules. I don't know if he does. I also think it's kind of an open comics industry secret. I've heard that Jim Davis is kind of a collective of like 40 people now. Like Shakespeare. Yes. Right. Yes. (laughs) And we'll argue for years over, right, over who did what. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Garfield is really just an oral history at this point. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Kind of it's a like, Homeric. Uh, yeah, it's Homeric, exactly. Yeah. It's it's just it's yeah. really just being told and retold generation to generation. Bang, 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 bang. Ah, the phone's ringing. Okay, all right, okay. I guess there's only one thing to do now, and that's answer the call. Much like Click. the female Ghostbusters. You gotta do it, David. Exactly. They okay. did it, and now I'm doing and it. And I'd argue they did it well, but I'm not looking to start trouble here. Just look, answer look, the call. Look, it's just an ad... I, I don't want to get into it right now. We'll discuss it one day. But someday we'll definitely get to it. Yes, absolutely. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Doc. Doc Brown. Oh, I was waiting for you to answer. I heard you pick up the phone. I'm so sorry. It took me a second. Griff just wanted to suddenly reopen the Pandora's box of the 2016 Ghostbusters movie. And uh, okay. that was a whole thing. It's not it's not Griff Tannen. It's not the future bully. Uh, anyway, it's it's Griff Newman. It doesn't matter. What's going on with you, buddy? Buddy, I have a problem. Okay, what's the problem? It's an issue. It's an issue. It's an issue and a problem. And what is it? My bed is muddy. Your bed. I need great sheets. Y- yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we look, look, Doc. Great your sheets, bed, Marty. This is a stretch. Honestly, this is just a stretch. Stretch, stretch. Why do you keep using this word stretch, Marty? <laughs> I mean, look, I don't know, Doc. I feel like you probably heard us talk about Brooklyn Inn before. They're the home of the internet's favorite sheets. The great sheets that you're referring to. Great sheets. Hey, so go to Brooklyn and get some sheets. But can I tell you something else? They've also got these towels that are amazing. Towels? You know, they got varying levels of plushness. Uh, they're a little extra soft. They're a little extra absorbent. They can turn your bathroom into a miniature spa. So look, great sheets, sure. But today, I really, I, I just want to talk towels. Well, what about bathrobes, Marty? 
oh, oh, do they have a bathrobe? Do they have a bathrobe that I was wearing until about an hour ago? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a drag. I like to put around my home, the brown manor, wearing a bathrobe until I hit myself in the head and come up with an invention idea, money. Right, I do that too, except I I don't hit myself in the head. I just kind of drink coffee. I don't do it on but purpose. I, I know, I know. You're an accident prone person. Look. I'm still getting up. I'm showering every morning just to have some kind of routine and oh, hands, towels and their bathrobes. It's all so plush. It's the perfect way to start the day off right. OK, they're cozy. They're warm. They're very absorbent. It, it's just a little comfort for right now. Brooklyn is the perfect place to find all the comforts for home, including ultra soft towels. And they're so confident in their product that everything comes with a lifetime warranty. So. Use promo code CHECK for 10% off your first order at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. Promo code CHECK. Brooklinen. Everything you need to live your most comfortable life, Doc. Great shapes and towels. It's, it's interesting that you said, Josh, that you saw two first, then one, then three because I had the distinct thought watching this one, and this is definitely the one I've seen the least and, mm-hmm. and haven't seen in the longest amount of time. Uh, like, oh, this is really a franchise that is dependent on you seeing them in oh, yeah. order right. because it's so much about the echoes and the repetitions yes. of the exact same things over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know, it it has that, like, I keep on using this, but it's true. It's, it's structured like a fucking herald mm-hmm. where you, like, repeat the same three beats over and over again and, and heighten them in this way that, like you're saying, like, the, the hacky thing about improv class is people are always like, oh, the lazy third beat is you just go to space. Mm-hmm. You just do the same scene you've done the first two times, but you go to space because you've run out of stuff. Most franchises, third movie, suddenly they travel through time. Back to the Future yep. starts out with time travel starts out and weirdly time. does the opposite where it's like, this is the one that's kind of the least time travel heavy that mostly just kind of parks itself in one genre. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And just does like a mapping game. There's not like a lot of back and forth with time. We go back in time. We're stuck back in time. We got to get back to the 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 future. Yeah, yeah. You just got to get back to that future. Doc Brown never made a Lloyd team. Sorry. <laughs> Doc Brown never made a Lloyd <laughs> Which is team. weird because they're bo- cause that's in the name. <laughs> it's right. <Yeah. laughs> named after him. Not mm-hmm. named after him. He had a triple ground show, but he never made a Lloyd <laughs> a team. Triple, Christopher <laughs> right. Lloyd had a triple ground show. <laughs> Griff, you can always one up my jokes. <laughs> it's a suggestion of an occupation. <laughs> Uh, ben, you you haven't been able to say anything while we talked about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, who I believe you are you you uh, you petitioned a court to be adopted by, right? Like that was something <laughs> you're an adjunct you member, uh, an adjunct turtle. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna name my first kid either Bebop or Rocksteady. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> of course, right, right. Well, Number two, find two, out. Two, right, yeah. I can't wait for the for the species reveal. Like, is the kid a warthog or a rhinoceros? <laughs> it could go either way. But uh, yeah, yeah. Back to the Future Three. Ben, do you care about this one? Do you care about Back to the Future Three, Ben? Uh, my thoughts on Back to the Future Three are: I always thought it was corny that it was like yes, yeah, set in like the Wild West, like. You could do anything. Why are you like going like to this old time? <laughs> it is dusty, but you didn't care. It's dusty. dusty. I like that. Yeah. But yeah. I, I'm rewatching now. I, I I liked some of it. Biff is a, you know, wow. This version of Biff is crazy. It is the Feels thing. Good. Every time I rewatch <laughs> the is franchise, dirty, is what I'm trying to say. It's very I'm dirty. So dirty. Okay, <laughs> yeah. it's wild. That's like one thing that really stuck out with me. But all right, sorry, Griffin. <laughs> can, can I throw out a theory? Did, did Tom Wilson do too good of a job in these sequels to the detriment of his career? Like by being I, just I, so Reddit scary people. and like nasty, <laughs> and also. That he makes such wild choices right. in every interpretation, that he actually kind of is the most transformative across like Biff to old Biff to Griff mm-hmm. to 80s Biff to Mad Dog Tannen. And I saw people on our Reddit saying that they didn't even know that it was the same actor in this, that they knew obviously it was meant to be like a a, a Tannen ancestor, right. but that he is different enough in this because you watch the range of what he does in this. And you're like, it's very bizarre that he didn't really go on to have like 
a sitcom. That's, or that's be what I'm a saying. Constant like funny villain makes, or whatever it is. He should have had a good character actor career. Yeah. It makes yeah. no sense to me that he didn't have a sitcom. I mean, he popped up in sitcoms that I maybe never hit. And obviously he was so good in Freaks and Geeks, but amazing on Freaks and Geeks. But that's right. just six episodes. Like it's not like that he's in yeah. every part of that show. And like he does a lot of voice work, but it's just weird that considering these movies are such big hits, like yeah. no one was calling. Like, or maybe they were and maybe he didn't want. I have no idea. Like I know. He seems like a pretty it, happy I, guy. He does. i he's a stand-up. I and I've heard that the people who've done stand up with him, I believe his reputation is like solid dude to work with. Like right. pretty uh, you know, one like, of the nicest guys in the yeah. world. Yeah, that's one of those all guys I've like, heard from people. Hey, yeah. I had this cool experience being in these three huge movies. That rules. Like what a nice way to right. what a nice way to think of a career. Right. Like, by I, all accounts, there's no bitterness on his part. And I think he does very well as a stand up and he does very well doing voiceover and stuff. I saw that he's like a regular on SpongeBob. He just does a lot of like supporting SpongeBob characters. I mean I think he does fine, but you all so just go based on everyone else in this franchise, you know, and even just like, um, why am I forgetting his name? The actor who plays uh, Principal Strickland and all the different Stricklands, uh, uh, James oh, Tolkien. Right. Who's also I, I like his uh, cameo in this one a lot. Uh, great. But but he is an example of like he was like, you know, an 80s like New York cop character actor who gets in this big movie. And then he had a run of other shit where he's in like the He-Man movie where people were using him as this kind of like hard ass in other family films. For sure. And Tom Wilson is just kind of like he doesn't do anything like this again. Then Freaks and Geeks is 10 years later, and he's so good in that, but obviously that show isn't watched at the time. It feels like if it had been, he probably would have then had a second wind. Um, but he's just so goddamn good in in all three of these movies. He is. Um, I think that everyone's good in these movies. I'm trying to think yeah. of like a weak spot in the Back to the Future cast, and there isn't really one like... The Elizabeth Shue slash uh, Claudia Wells, you know, girlfriend role is always underwritten. But like, that's kind of yeah. it, right? Like, the only weird thing is that Crispin Glover doesn't come back. Yes. I rewatching them, Shue is the performance that sticks out to me as being just a little bit too big. But right, right. I also can't really blame her because she's sliding in on two and what they give Jennifer to do in these two movies sucks. Yeah. Like, at least in the first one, Claudia Wells gets to, like, play a real teenager having, like, charming scenes with her boyfriend versus the sequels where she just falls asleep on a bunch of different surfaces. <laughs> right. Much kind of kind of like the Garfield of the Back to the Future universe. Very much. She hates Monday. She, she hates Monday. She loves. There's a whole lasagna subplot that they cut because she faints into a giant pan of lasagna. That was one of the scenes, the deleted scenes. Oh uh, boy. Um, but right, like even Flea's good. Like even good job yeah. by Flea. Yeah. Everyone's good. I mean, it, it also gets back to this thing I, I said in our episode for two, which is like I think this franchise is fundamentally so much more character based than other franchises you know it's so much about the dynamics and the relationships and even with the different timelines and the different time periods it's so much about how those things echo and what these people mean to each other and all of that in a way that's just like you know it's it's hard for actors to make this type of impression in an inflated franchise that has so much world building to do and so many payoffs to handle. Whereas this, all the payoffs are interpersonal. Right. Yeah. And this movie does have that nice, like, Oh, this feels like a nice season finale, like yeah. or a series finale. Yep. Like it just puts a nice bow and leaves everyone in a place where you feel happy and good about the fact that right. you're probably never going to see them. But again. also it's that kind of season finale or series finale where if it got renewed, you'd be like, I get where they'd pick up here. You know, like it feels mm -hmm. it it feels like the end of this franchise. But I, I was reading some review that kind of said that it felt like it could be the first episode of like a sci-fi procedural, which it oh, did yeah. feel a little like quantum leapy. Uh in the, which I loved Quantum Leap. You know what I mean? Like it did feel like the most like we gotta go to a time, solve a problem, and then move move on. Right. I think right. I like that. That it's sort of back to the first movie's thing of like there it's really hard to travel through time. And like mm -hmm. we're gonna need to yeah. do all this stuff to engineer that happening again. Whereas two obviously is having so much fun 
traveling as, through time as much as it can. It's also, I, I mean, I remember as a kid seeing the covers at, like at the video store and feeling like, oh, is that all this franchise is? Is it just like each movie is a different set of costumes, mm-hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. Like it's the it's the magic tree house or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, the next one, they're going to go to medieval times. The next one, this like I didn't understand. There's no reason you would know from the box that it is about these sort of like the intricacies of, of the family history, you know, and trying to correct timelines and all this sort of stuff. And this is the one that like you have the looming specter of the gravestone. You know, Mm -hmm. Doc Brown's death date uh, and knowing that the train is coming. But then most of the middle section of the movie is just like, well, we just got some time to kill. Yeah. (laughs) Let's just be in the old West. But maybe we'll have a gunfight. Maybe we won't. Yeah. But but there's there's like there's stakes to this that I don't. Well, I like this or maybe it's just that I like the stakes. It feels more personal. I feel like Doc is uh Sort of the he's a character finally, which he, he he's so good in one, but even in one, like he's yeah. more just kind of like sidekick, plot motivator, you know, exposition guy, right? You know, he's kind of like you know, sort of a, a tool has for in, the movie interiority here, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. In this, right, he's kind of more of and like Lloyd so obviously knows who he's playing and is so mm-hmm. ready to give you more doc, like. It's not like they are like you know foisting a plot on him that doesn't. It's just like it's so clear how much Lloyd loves being this character. So he's so sort of delightful, doing more than just being like great Scott and being surprised and yelling about science. Like you know, it's it's just nice to see him be cute. I love that added dimension because it feels like because Doc. He, I mean, the movie starts out with Doc caring about the rules so much, right? And like, don't go back and get me. Uh, let me live here. It's fine. And and for him to then like mess with the rules by like falling in love, like such a human thing, it's like really sweet and clearly establishes like this means a lot to Doc, a guy who's like always thinking about the big picture ramifications of time travel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, right. I mean, that's where the stakes become very clear in the movie because it is – you know, I, I go on and on about this, but like, especially for big franchise movies, I feel like the battles always have to be ideological in addition to whatever the external threat or issue is. Right. It's why stuff like Black Panther or Wonder Woman works so much better for me than most superhero movies. And the fact that you do have the character at the crossroads like that, that you have Doc Brown kind of fighting himself. Mm-hmm. That they're not just like, oh, we have to figure out how to get the car to work again. But it's really this like, I don't know if I like the premise of these movies anymore. <laughs> like the characters yeah, right. within the franchise are fighting against the entire idea of the franchise. And I also think in this weird way where like Back to the Future Part 2 is very much about sequels and trying to like revisit the first movie and make it again and all of that sort of stuff. This one is very much the like... Is, is it natural to keep a story going? You know, do you start to punish the characters by continuing to pull them through it? And Doc Brown over and over again just keeps on saying, like, I never should have invented it in the first place. Right. Like, this whole thing's a nightmare. It's made everything worse. The first movie never should have happened. It's, <laughs> like, you have, it's triumphant when the DeLorean is destroyed, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It feels like an important course correction. There's a thing I saw on the blank check subreddit that kind of blew my mind uh and i'm gonna paraphrase it because it's long uh but sg standard i want to give credit is the username and they pointed out obviously this is a franchise that is so defined by the lack of crispin glover in the last two movies right it's like sure especially considering that he's the dilemma in the first movie Mm -hmm. you have to imagine that he would have been a key part of all three of these films, you know, uh, at, you know, at the very least, like the, the Seamus McFly thing would be replaced with something entirely different and probably a more emotionally substantive in that place. And part two would be a lot more about him. Um, and I think they make the right decision. The decision that like Rise of Skywalker should have made, which is write the movie around the fact that the guy is missing, like make a movie about the absence of this character who matters rather than pretend that you still got him. But 
Crispin Glover's whole sort of friction with Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis on the first movie was that he hated the fucking ending. And he hated that at the end of the day, it's about, look, the house is nicer. The dad's successful. He's famous. Biff works for him. Like everything's shiny. Marty has the nice car. It's a very yuppie 80s materialistic sort of happy ending, which Zemeckis is always contended is satirical. And uh, Chris McGlover was like, we should have an ending. This is a movie for families and the kids are going to see that isn't so beholden to those ideals that, that should be more about the value of what these people mean to each other. And then two and three, kind of, even though they become defined by the fact that Chris McGlover doesn't do them are like addressing his complaints for the first movie. Like Back to the Future 2 is all about Marty trying to prioritize materialism. Right. Find the way to use and money corrupting the, to get the really world rich. into a mm-hmm. dystopia. Everything. Right. Yes. Right. Right. It just destroys everything. And Back to the Future Part 2 is like we're just going to slow down and make this all about relationships. It is three. Part exclusively three. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 3. I'm sorry. 3 is just the like this is just about what these people mean to each other and if you're with the person that makes you happy then that's the happy ending, and not the nicer house. Even when your life's work is destroyed, right? What you what what's important is that you found this relationship and you've abandoned this like hyper uh, productivity driven sense, of, which is like what Doc. If if Doc was defined by anything, right? It was de- he was defined by his work in, in, early yeah. on in in the franchise. And so for him to give that up and go like, what's important is I found this person and we have a family, and now I'm going to come back to 1985 and, and see my friend Marty, and my my life's work gets destroyed, and I'm happier than I've ever been. Right. Yeah. Right. It's it's the one thing that hit me watching it this time. I know we're going all yeah, out of whatever, order, but like. <laughs> and and it, in the theme the, of the yeah, the Fritz the Facts of the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh there's no way they could do this because they didn't have Crispin Glover. But it makes me realize like the best ending for this movie would be when he goes back to his parents' place with Jennifer that it's not the timeline from the end of the first movie. It's not the yuppie successful mm. novelist, you know, that it's not that they're rich, but that his parents are happy together. Like, it feels like you need one last ripple effect of of the status quo of his home life that isn't just they're all really successful now. But you can't pull that off emotionally without having the actor. Yeah, there. I also wonder if that well would still be fun because, like, you don't want to repeat the stakes and it's hard to know exactly how you're not repeating the stakes. But, I mean, mm-hmm. it would be better if Glover was around, certainly. The other yeah. thing is that, and I'm not the only person to observe this, I'm sure. Like, Marty himself does not actually have a lot to do in either of these sequels. He's kind of just, like, experiencing the sequels. Like, and he's moving through them. But, like... His personal stakes are kind of low. So it's kind of what you're complaining about, Griffin, right? Like, it's sort of like, right. you know, Doc Brown, uh, you know, in the second movie, it's just kind of apocalypse is what you have to deal with. In the third movie, Doc is is the center point. But, like, Marty, you know, Fox is always good because he's he's a yeah. delightful actor, like, and he, he knows what he's doing. But Marty is just kind of like, oh, my God, like, through two movies. Yeah, I mean, two, you have, you know, his dad's life's at stake, you know, his mom's happiness is at stake. Like, it's, he does, he's more personally invested based on the relationships around him. Uh, But he does become a more sort of passive character. I mean, he's always been a pretty reactive character, and it's the reason why they shoehorn in the chicken stuff so hard. I mean, they've openly talked about that. Which I don't They were just like, it feels very like, we have to give him this thing that he's overcoming or learning to con- to suppress in his own life, right? And it, and they they pay it off at the very end, and it, it does feel very like, oh, we have to put this hero on a journey, and this is what it is, right? That's the problem. Is it so transparently seems like exactly what it is yes. actually doing? Mm-hmm. Like you can see it as a storytelling move rather yes. than anything organic, especially because 
I stood corrected because I, I didn't remember the chicken being in the first movie at all. But in fact, Biff does say it to him once, as as Nicole right. reminded but us. But he doesn't. Um, Mar- Marty doesn't exactly like blow his top over it, although he does. It's fight not an Biff. atomic bomb. Right, like right. it's not a self-destruct button for him. Whereas this, it like fully becomes his kryptonite. And for these two movies, and I feel like especially this one, because Marty has so little to do. It's all just about this, like, are you yellow bellied thing, um, which for me, bumps only because it's not something inherent to the things we liked about the guy in the first movie. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a... uh, The best kind of sequel writing is you find something that was there all along and you deepen it, you know? But this feels like such an artificial deepening. Um, It does feel like what he needs to come to terms with is his fear of his future, and becoming his parents, which his parents suddenly just becoming like the suburban ideal doesn't really solve that, you know? Right. Because now it's just like, well, they're good. I'll be fine. I got the car. Yeah. I mean, the weirdest part is that he has siblings. Like when they come out in three, you're so like, weird. right, he has siblings. <laughs> right. I guess they're doing fine, too. Great. I mean, it, when, it, yeah, yeah, whatever. No, no, I just I read when Joe Sperber was like nine months pregnant when they were shooting two. So they shot a scene with his brother in the alternate, like, hell 1985, where he's drunk and he's yelling about Biff. And it's a pretty good scene, but they found that people were more worried about what happened to the sister if you saw the brother. So then they cut both of them out. And by the time they shot this, a couple months later, she was able to go to set. But it does feel like they're pretty much totally dropped for the better part of two movies. Which is fine. You know, they're not the most yeah. compelling characters. And especially in this one, I don't know what we would need to see from them either. Like how yeah. how they would fit or how we'd want them to fit. I do. You're talking about how like uh, you were talking about how two is so much darker. It's like weirdly simultaneously darker and more cartoony because it's like so manic and it's so like in love with all the time travel possibilities. The opening of this one is so interesting to me just because like first back to the future you have like the the opening with the clocks and the wall the amplifier and then almost immediately you go into power of love marty skateboarding across town being the fucking coolest kid 80s teen movie shit right second movie you start with the ending of the first and then you have that big credit sequence where you're flying in the clouds and the sylvester score is playing at full blast and it feels so triumphant and then this one you start with you're seeing The same scene for the third time, Doc Brown celebrating after the DeLoreans disappeared. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's like the third time you've seen this and the second time you've seen the new addendum of Marty showing up. And then it goes to that like very kind of quiet, weirdly melancholy opening credit sequence where it's the new theme that he wrote for this. What's kind of like the Clara romance love theme. It's not the exciting back to the future stuff. And it's just the Brown mansion at night, like during the rain, you know, like quiet him sleeping. It's, it's like a very muted step down from a movie that was so bug nuts, bananas. And then it's, and then after that opening sequence, It is, it's like a while before anything cool happens, you know, like it's, it gets very expositiony very quickly where like Marty and Doc are like explaining this, all this stuff that's happened in other times. And, you know, Marty's catching Doc up, Doc's warning Marty. And so it's a lot of like, um, like winding the clock so that, so that exactly, so that we can, so that all the cool stuff can just kind of like happen in perpetuity for the rest of the movie. Right, there's like 10 to 15 minutes straight of of chalkboard scenes. Sci-fi which shit. Which the other two right. Back to the Future movies give you like half an hour of just cool shit happening right. before there's a great Scott moment and someone has to explain what's at risk. And this, it's like, you have that subdued opening, then you find out that Doc Brown is dead. You know, you see the tombstone. Like, it, everything's very kind of like small scale and insular and quiet and just sort of peace setting, not in the same way that Gale and Zemeckis usually do, where it's like so fun that you don't realize the pieces are being set up. This is very transparently, as you said, like clock winding. And then minute 17 is when the car goes. Like, but it's it's pretty much 15 straight minutes of like uh, vegetables. 
You know, yeah. not that they're not charming. No, but you're right. You're right. It's a slow start. You're right. Yeah. They're so watchable and charming, but it's also like, okay, remember Back to the Future. We're going to do one, but it's different now. And then they tell you why it's different. And then then they go to that parking lot and then you can see like, oh, it's about to be action time. Yeah. Yeah. And I do. I mean, I just love uh, the the smash cut, the like match cut uh, mm-hmm. with the Indians on the drive through theater to them like charging after him. Like, it's fun to see him put on the the tacky pink cowboy outfit. Yeah. And just like you do get a little amped when you're like, oh, this might be like fun to, for them to play in this territory. It, it, it is, is fun. It is Wait, fun. what is it this? Is fun. It is fun. It's this is a great fine. movie. It's fun. Robert yes, Zemeckis it's made definitely fine. a Western with Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox in a flying train. It's got a shootout. It's got comedy drinking. It's got all yep. kinds of, uh, you know, it's got romance. It's got Oscar winner Mary Steenburgen. It's great. This is a great movie. It's, it's Zemeckis. It's so much fun. There, It's, it's so, so much fun. fun. I mean, that's like, it. it's like, there's just so much fun stuff that happens, which I love in a movie generally. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I, I think that's such a wonderful trick to... Josh, are you, you know, telling like, me you love fun? I love what? fun. Wait, what, but what, I mean, what is this? I, <laughs> this is such a basic thing to say. But like, in a when you watch like a Fast and Furious movie, you get the impression mm-hmm. that they were just like, what cool thing could we do next? Sure. And this this had yes. that appeal to me. It was it it felt it feels like uh let's do a bunch of fun stuff in a row. If that makes sense. That's yeah, no, Gil and Zemeckis talk about like that's how they would write these movies together, where they would just come up with a bunch of flashcards that weren't what are the important story beats. They are what are fun things we would like to see happen in this movie? And then they hold themselves to, we have to earn all of these things, figure out a story that supplies all of them. But they definitely write, like, the fun scenes first. Uh, I also think they're just so good at character comedy that, like, even when things feel a little homeworky, they just write such good telling sort of character moments, and then they just cast exactly the right actors and they find exactly the right comedic pitch where everything's really nice. I also just think, like, in terms of is there anything else that Back to the Future 3 could have been, David and I, massive defenders of Iron Man 3, of what we both contend is the best Marvel movie, hmm. and which a lot of people don't like. And I, I feel like one of the reasons I love it, that I feel like other people dislike it, is that the suit is out of commission for most of the movie. Right. Because it just really feels like at that point... In terms of stories where Iron Man is the one guy at the center, Avengers movies are obviously their own fucking thing. It's like the suit had become too powerful. He had too many versions. There was like so little threat or tension when he had this stuff, you know, at his disposal. And it's great that it's like, oh, three is him having to like Jerry rig stuff from Home Depot to figure out how to break into a home. And it's also, I think the best decision this movie makes is like, Minute 20, they fucked everything up. The car's out of commission. Like, yeah, Doc Brown yeah. couldn't fix it in the Old West. Marty drove it back, but then got the gas tank, like, punctured. So now they have no fuel. They have no way to get there. They have no equipment, you know, no technology to fix it. And it's just sort of like, oh, there's such a narrow, like, window back to the first movie of how we could even possibly get this car to work. There's one possible minute that we could make this happen and we're going to make it happen either by an inch or we're going to fall off a cliff. Yes. And that's a really, really good story decision because you have to scale it back after two. And it's great. I think, and and I think really the, the Marty journey that's like more uh, important than the chicken stuff, like the, the Marty stuff is like yes. him letting go of trying to make sure Doc doesn't fall in love, right? Like that's hmm. him. He wants Doc to not fall in love so they can they can complete their journey as friends back to 1985, which is the mission he thought he was on. But the mission he's really on is letting Doc live his human life. Yes, exactly. Right, right. And that fits in well with the bigger franchise. Like it's Marty trying to fix his family thing. Like to some degree, Doc Brown is now family to him. Doc Brown's kind of his real dad in a way. So, right. right. And, and also the only friend we ever see him have. <laughs> yes. Yes. Inarguably. 
Right, like his second best friend is Needles, and that guy sucks. <laughs> it's also, it's weird that his he has like a girlfriend, which is like, uh, when yes. you're in high school, that's like a, a, a move that you need like a certain amount of social fluency to do. And then his best friend Absolutely. is an old man. <laughs> right, right. Like his yeah, birthday parties must be so weird. It's this thing that, like, I, I the more rewatching these three movies, this really stuck out to me of, like, right, so, like, you see his band at the beginning, but otherwise, you never see him socializing with other kids. And there's this thing where, like, every time he ends up anywhere, everyone likes him. Mm-hmm. Like, he's very popular in the 50s. He's very popular in the Old West. Yeah, he's very likable. He, like, he's a likable guy. Right, but he... But he's also, like, not a particularly sociable guy. He weirdly only cares about his girlfriend and this old man and everyone else he, like, doesn't really care about. And it is, like, he has such a, like, he has so much emotional investment. A, I feel like this movie is him realizing, oh, fuck, I actually really do care about Doc. Like, this is such a Doc and Marty buddy movie, where in the other two, I feel like they're just, like, Obviously, we understand that for some reason they're friends, but the movies just jump into we have to solve this shit together. And this one is Marty having to kind of let go of his friend and be like, I want you to be happy. I have to accept that my right. status quo of you being the guy I can go visit who lives in a garage isn't what might be best for you. Or for Marty. It might be good or for, for Marty to like go to college and like meet some people his own age. <laughs> Yeah. 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 You can't just you can't just time travel with an old man forever. Eventually you have to settle down in some year or another and live your life chronologically. That's a good take. I'll say um, the hundred year hundred year old thing hit me more this time around. I know I said like I don't mm. I never really felt like I liked this as a kid, this movie, but it was interesting to think about how the franchise was like, all right, let's do the hundred year old version of this town. And like, right. right. Thinking about like the legacy of like families who like are all from like the same town and stuff. Like, I don't know. It was interesting. I feel like it made me think of my own family. Cause like they, I have, I grew up in a really old house <laughs> and I've had relatives in my town throughout like the history and whatnot. You grew up in a monster house, we should mention. <laughs> a monster house? Just because it, it, it's relevant to Zemeckis. Your house also does have the spirit of an old lady in it, right? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. But it is like, um, it's more fun that it's an old tannin than if it was just some other uh, surly gunslinger, right? Right, in the same way that it's fun that like, oh man, Strickland's the marshal. Like, it's so much about the sort of like... Uh, how much we cannot run away from whether it's nature or nurture who our family is, mm-hmm. like traits that just get passed on from generation to generation. Right. Um, all, all that discovery stuff is fun for me in the same way that I like that. I forget her character, but Leah Thompson's character in this movie looks like Lorraine. Cause it's like, well, I don't know, but like people are attracted to people who look like they're like there's edible shit you know yeah but it is bananas <laughs> it's weird it's made uh, it's made all the weirder because because he's Michael playing Seamus. Right. right yes that is right. that is yes. the decision where you're like look i understand how you talked yourself yourselves into this like gail and yeah. zemeckis but it's sort of unlearning the lesson of back to the future one to have right. them just be married in this one even if they're playing yeah. different people. Yes, for sure. It it it's like, what is that echoing in a way that we can learn from? And then it right, like as Griffin was saying, it's like sometimes you just want to fuck your mom. <laughs> right. right, right. Like I do, I think there's something to like faces reoccurring in families, you know? Sure. And like people going for types that remind them of mm-hmm. what they grew up with and things like that. But it's that being that one to one and makes it weird. And we already have the Marty McFly type. It's Marty McFly. Right. He's there. He's in the scene. Right. Right. I'm realizing it either needed to be Crispin Glover and Leah Thompson or it needed to be Michael J. Fox and Elizabeth Shue. Yes. Like it yes. would have yes. worked with that. I mean, no. I mean, it would work more maybe, but not really because you still would then have the question of like, well, wait, 
did their kid, does their ancestor turn out to be a McFly or a, a shoe? I forget what the uh, Parker. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah. Like, is this like fucking like royals in the 19th century where like they're all really just they're all over Europe, yeah, Hill, but they're really Hill all Valley just related just, to each other? Yeah. So inbred. Yeah. I also just forgot how little she has to do in this movie. Like uh, Le- uh, Leah Thompson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's, she doesn't get much. Right. You have that the opening. I just always remember the mirroring of the wake up. Don't worry, you're in blank. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm in blank right. like scene. But then after that, she just kind of like looks sad a lot. Like she just says a lot of like, well, it's what we have. And it's also like, I feel like she's pretty invested in trying to realistically play like an Irish immigrant, she's you know, doing like the accent. Yep. harder times. Yep. Right. And I think there's like a real kind of melancholy, like an honest melancholy, like a uh, hard fought spirit within her. And then Michael J. Fox is kind of doing like, doi, 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 doi. <laughs> like yeah. I don't know if he has a and, strong take on Seamus. <laughs> no, and he's fun. And like, as you said, like, Mike Jake Fox it rules in these movies. Yeah. But he's very much doing... It's it's both of them repeating what they did in Back to the Future Part 2, where Leah Thompson's just like, I'm gonna go so much deeper and sadder into this character in playing that alternate 85 version. And Michael J. Fox is like, cool, I get to wear six different costumes. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it even at, as that his intro to the Wild West and his family ends she's like Seamus you can't bring him in here right you're we're gonna bring a curse right. to our family and that doesn't feel like it pays off super well no she's just kind of the worrier and Seamus is just kind of incredibly steady it's yeah. one of the things that makes him a little uninteresting is he just sort of like shows up to go like well you know I've always believed <laughs> yeah well no, who cares what I say and then whistles and like, walks away right there was a bad McFly and he's dead so I'll just tell you about the mistakes he made and like that yeah. will reflect the decisions you need to make about improving yourself, which is fine. I don't care. We're in the wild West. They're shooting. Sure. I, did I mention that the train is, you know, time travels and flies. It's and a stuff. time like, train, is, David. Yeah. This is a good movie. <laughs> time yeah, it's probably David, should have won best David, picture. David, I don't know what one that you're dancing well, with wolves. It's the best the time train I've probably. seen. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. Look, we'll get to the time train when we get to the time train. But it does feel like All you have that trickle in line. Sorry. <laughs> All in due train. I apologize. No, don't apologize. Five comedy points. Five comedy Griffin, points. Thank Josh. you. And I apologize still. You get five comedy points for the apology as well. Thank you. David. Yeah. David. I I it's me. It's David Sims. It's me, Griffin Newman. It's we're still doing, doing the episode that you've been listening to. Ah, you know, I mean, it's what we love to do. We love doing this episode right now. Back to the Future, Part Three. Ask me if I like doing this episode. You like doing this episode? Indeed. Now ask me another question. Ask me the best number one job site in the world. Uh, what's the number one job site in the world? The best one. Indeed. Do you see Indeed. what I did com. there? They're both the same answer. I know, I know, I know, but right, because you're talking about Indeed.com. I'm talking about the Indeed.com. The site that gets you the best people fast. Ask yes, me if I'm right. talking about Indeed.com. You talking about Indeed.com? Indeed. Now, that ah. was kind of a mashup of the two, because the first time you asked me, yeah. I was using Indeed to describe my reaction. The second time I was using it to actually answer the name of the site and the third time I was saying affirmative, yes, that is the name of the site, Indeed.com. Right. It, it has so many meetings. And also, Indeed gives you full control and payment flexibility over your hiring, unlike mm-hmm. other sites. Absolutely. You only pay for what you need. Yeah. You pause your account anytime. Yeah. There are no long-term contracts. And it's got these powerful tools to make your hiring search a, a lot easier. Uh, you got sponsored jobs. Yes. Those are three and a half times more likely to result in a hire. I'm sorry. What do you want to say? No, I was just going to say if you're looking to hire, for example, like a new school teacher, because the school teacher you hired went into a canyon. She had a runaway horse drawn carriage. Right, 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 right. Exactly. No one was there to save her. Then you could go to Indeed.com and hire a new science student. If you're looking for a new sarsaparilla salesman, something like that. A new blacksmith. Right. I, uh, I mean, inventor. I mean, blacksmith. Uh, They've got 73% of online 
job seekers visiting Indeed each month. And it's going to get you the important hire you need, just like they have for over 3 million businesses. So right now, Indeed is offering our listeners a free $75 credit to cool. boost your job post, which means more quality candidates will see it fast. Okay? Yeah. You can try Indeed out with a free $75 credit at Indeed.com slash check. This is their best offer available anywhere. Go right now to Indeed.com slash check. Terms and conditions apply. Offer valid through December 31st. Uh, David, ask me if the offer is valid through December 31st. Is is the offer valid through December 31st? Indeed. All right. You have the Strickland line in the first movie where he says, like, no McFly has ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley and no one ever will, right? Right, right. right. And, and Marty says history is about to change. It fucks with the game a little bit. And as much as Marty has like a real character struggle, it is this idea of I don't want to be tied down to what a McFly has always been. I want to be my own person. It fucks with that to then have Sheamus be like, no, I'm pretty well adjusted. <laughs> 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 what is his job even? Is he like a farmer? I guess they have a farm, right? I don't know. He's like, he's like the town therapist. Like he just <laughs> seems so balanced. You know? Like it's it's not once again, it's not Fox's failing, but it just feels like they never came up with a hook for that character outside of well, we we still have this technology where we can have two Michael J. Foxes on screen at the same time. And and yeah, because it, it is so much about like the shadow of of the family history. It's like, well, uh, my brother was a piece of shit, and my son, who you're meeting right now, is the first American McFly. You've heard stories about him. I'm the one who is just super okay. Yeah, what's the problem with him? He's just chilling. He doesn't seem cursed at all. No, he seems great. Yeah, he's he's married to his mom. He's got a sweet baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's he's shooting little. Uh, rodents to to feed his fam he's doing family yep. he's doing well no fam he calls them fam water he, he yeah. came up with that in in california i didn't feel right when i said it but i think <laughs> it, it is authentic to the character no he, he, he invented fam he invented hashtag squad goals he's very <laughs> right. like ahead of his just time just an old timey one of those cameras that like poof and then there's smoke and it's sepia tone it's a t- hashtag a squad type. goals at the bottom you see them chiseling in <laughs> hashtag squad goals um so marty wakes up well, yeah what are we doing he's chased by a bear the minute i saw the bear i just want to mention the bear I just thought about mm-hmm. like that job in Hollywood, like the guy who wrangles the bear, you know, where it's like, we're going to need a bear one... and you call like the one guy, right? Like there can't be a lot of there guys. There's that one bears. bear. Right. There's that one bear, Bart the bear, who has like 20 major bear credits. Like almost every major bear in a movie was Bart the bear until like yes. 1996. You think when other bears go into the casting office and they see Bart oh, there, they're just Bart. like, ah, fuck. Oh, fuck. I thought he was busy. I thought he was working on something. <laughs> My agent told me he was out of state shooting a thing. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, Bart the bear haunted Gandolfini for years. Like every time he'd just be like, they're going <laughs> to right. give it to Bart. Uh, there's a Bart the Bear, too, who has no relation to Bart the Bear, just fucking stole his name. That sucks. And also is in movies like he did Evan Almighty. He did uh, We Bought a Zoo. He he was in an episode of Scrubs. Bart the Bear, too. Mm. Yeah, Bart the if Bear, Bart too. Bart the Bear is the is in this Bart the Bear's big final credit was The Edge. No, like he does The uh, Edge in 97, does Meet the Deedles in 1998 and retire. No, he, but I'm saying Edge was really the high note. Edge is the high note because he's like the third lead. But no, uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's a black bear in this movie that's chasing him, right. not, a, not a grizzly. So so whatever. It's some other bear someone had. I'm sorry. I know this is a tangent. Can I just very quickly read through the character names? I won't even read through the titles. Just the character names that Bart the Bear played over the course of his career. Please? Yeah. The Bear. Yep. The Bear Uncredited. The Bear Uncredited. <laughs> the Bear Uncredited. Bear Uncredited. <laughs> bear Uncredited. The Bald-Headed Bear. The Kodiak Bear. Bear. The Bear. The Bear. Bear Uncredited. The Bear. The Bear Walking Thunder in the movie Walking Thunder, <laughs> Bear Uncredited, Bear parentheses as Bart in <laughs> Homeward Bound 2, Lost in San Francisco, in Les Amants du Rivière Rouge, a TV miniseries in France, it's the bear attacking children and fighting with Ari Schweig. 
<laughs> and then his last two credits are the bear and the bear. <laughs> he went back to the old stuff, you back know. Back to his roots. Right, right, one right. Thing, one thing that I love about that is that he's either bear uncredited or the title role of the film. Yes, right. Uh, bear, bear uncredited was I, Angelina Jolie's breakthrough performance, right? <laughs> bear uncredited, yes. He's got a lot. I mean, there's Clan of the Cave Bear. Yeah, classic. There's The Bear. Clan right. of the Cave Bear I mean, with uh, Daryl of... Hannah. Yeah, The Bear. The Bear yeah. was a big one. That, I think he <laughs> actually bear. is top build in. I'm not joking. Really? Yeah, because, I mean, see. that movie is really just about a bear. Like, that's, it's, uh, the bear is the only character. David, you are absolutely right. Bart the bear, first build as the Kodiak bear. That rules. Yuke the bear, second build as the bear cub. What a career to for a Cairo, third build as Tom. Wow, Checky Cairo got fucked in those negotiations. Fucked. He's behind two bears? <laughs> Can you imagine Checky Cairo's agent calling him up and being like, Checky, baby, I got great news for you. Okay, okay. Checky, you are the top build human in this movie. Now, okay, question. When sure. You don't top build, build Checky. I got you top billing. I'm the top build actor in this movie? You yes, you are the top build human actor you in this keep movie. Keep saying human actor, which I <laughs> There are two, two bears in front of you, but Checky, I mean bears. who's going to get build up two bears? Two bears. <sighs> two bears. It's one of them Bart. Of course. Yeah, Bart got first billing, right? Okay. He's above the title. Okay. He, re- he respects Bart. He respects Bart. Third this bill. other bear, he doesn't give a shit about. He doesn't. No. Uke doesn't give a shit about Uke. <laughs> Do you know what the tagline is for the bear? I don't know. There's a bear. You'll never John believe- Jacka knows the bear. Yes. It, it says he's an orphan at the start of a journey, a journey to survive. And then at the bottom of the poster in a box, it says... Since its release in the rest of the world earlier this year, the bear has smashed virtually every box office record and now ranks as one of the most successful films ever released. (laughs) All right. Big brag. It's like a real mouthful of a thing to brag about on a poster. I know. I know. I mean, this is just like a fancy way of saying thing like this did well in Europe. It's like, okay, fine. I'll go see it. It made $2 million in America. The smash hit sensation that's been taking over the world. Instead, it's just like, listen, listen to me (laughs) since it's released in the rest of the world. (laughs) Like It's such a serious talk. All right. I take it back. It made $29 million in America. That's not bad for a movie starring a bear and also Mm -hmm. starring a bear. And the... Bart the Bear had was mostly most of his deal was on the back end, so this was huge for him. <laughs> he was a yeah. canny negotiator. That's yeah. Everyone says that about Bart the Bear. Uh, he also he was notable in the industry at that time. He had the biggest cave of any actor. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I it started was like the all Will this. Smith cave, like a double decker cave. He got the most salmon out of everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, his writer uh, was yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> uh, before David unfortunately derailed this podcast mm-hmm. with this bear side tangent, uh, Ben, you make a good point. It's this thing I feel like we keep coming back to, which is just like these movies being made at the exact right point where like the year and the clean amount of time that they're traveling to always has like the most resonance. And, and that way where it's like, 1985, 1885, 100 years apart on the nugget. It's like, right, that is when this town would have been formed. That's when his family would have had their first generation hitting the ground. It's the beginning of that family legacy, all these family legacies, the clock tower being built. Like, there's just kind of this beautiful symmetry to it. I agree. You're seeing the the origin of the of the Hill Valley mythology. I don't think it hits for kids as much, though. Like, I, I don't, I feel like that's like a thing that definitely really more interests me just like right now. So I, I do mm. like it as a choice, but this like feels less and less like a thing that's enjoyable for kids and more about the franchise, maybe. Well, I think Gail and Zemeckis grew up loving Westerns. Yes. Michael J. Fox loves Westerns. And they were like, oh, we'll make a Western like what we grew up loving. And I think children of 1990 were just kind of like, eh. That's the only place they're going to? You're not going to feudal Japan? 
All right. Right. <laughs> You're a funeral, buddy. <laughs> I'm feudal Japan or out. And they better not have a map, by the way. I'm just making no, that clear. No map. No clues either. <laughs> Don't give them a single clue. And and by God, if I see a slice, a single slice of pizza. Oh. Oh, no, that's that's the conflict. That's the reward we want at the end of the movie. One single slice for a job well done. Uh, if I see so much as a grease soaked paper plate. Oh, God. I'm trying to me. think because City Slickers is like the year after. Right. Like the Western. Right, there's is there's is a not, revival right after this. Yeah, because you've got Dances with Wolves. You have the the the. Uh, the sort of fancy Western on its way back. And Unforgiven. You have Which two is this year. Westerns Fan- Dance win Rules best, is this best year. picture. Yeah. And, and Un- Unforgiven is in a couple of years. And like, but the Western right now, even like, because this is probably coming out before Dance with Wolves, is, is a very uncool genre in the 80s. No one wants yeah. Westerns yes. in the 80s, right? Like, that's just not the thing. No. So that's... No, no, I mean... Right, you have the, the them, Silverado, uh, uh, Young Guns. Like sure. I, I feel like Young Guns was Sexy the one successful Westerns. one. Yeah, right. But it was so much the like, oh, we're doing the anachronistic brat pack western, and Silverado was sort of like grew in reputation. Lonesome Dove is the year before this. But you're right. There's sort of a western resurgence that happens right after this. This movie doesn't get set in the West based on studio notes. It only happens because these guys love western movies and they have a blank check to do whatever the fuck they want and this is i the first zemeckis movie i mean like i want to hold your hand is obviously sentimental for beatlemania it's not like he you know 1941 like he does these throwbacky movies but this is the first one that feels sentimental which i feel yes. like is a thing that is going to define a lot of his future movies like forrest gump like the polar express like you know you know he's he's kind of a sentimental filmmaker now but this is the first one where it really feels like he's sort of like wistful about a bygone age. He's kind of saying goodbye to something he created, yeah. right? You know, like it's this sort of weirdly sweet movie, which, yes, no studio would be like, yeah, for the third one, just kind of, yeah, you know, you know, you should just really just like say a wistful goodbye. <laughs> right. And also up until this point, he's he's a pretty satirical filmmaker like it's always he's, been he's got thing a bit makes... of a cynical yeah exactly 100 right. and this movie doesn't feel cynical at all no, no at all it's got none of it and i feel like that's always this thing that makes a so unreadable but also interesting is it's like well he's like the ultimate boomer but but it also feels like he has so much contempt in him he's like constantly telling this line before this between this like sort of nostalgic embrace and wanting to call Call out the ugliness that we tend to gloss over and like back to the future is one of those movies where people analyze like what is he saying with like marty mcfly inventing rock and the dad becoming a successful novelist at the end or is he saying anything you know and two is going so far in the other direction and then this is just like the, you know the time train at the end is uh this, the moment where I'm like, this really feels like a Disney movie, and I don't say that derisively. Mm. Like, the story of their struggle to get this movie set up, the first Back to the Future set up anywhere, because people thought it was too cute and sweet, despite it being about mom fucking. And then this one is like, this is kind of them making their, like, 50s or 60s live-action Disney adventure film, you know? There's yes, something yeah. about it, even in the stakes of the gunfights and the comedy and whatever. Yeah, this where it's movie just feels... Like it... Go ahead, Griff. Finish your thought. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's not a movie where anyone's going to die of dysentery, you know? It's not. It feels like a theme parky kind of... I know what you mean, like animatronic, right? Like, it's funny, but like a lot of these set pieces, like Biff... You know, being, you know, trying to start fights or things like that. Like they're, they're, they, they feel very safe and very amusing. And the there is no sense. The character uh, yeah. thing is so weird. Mm-hmm. Like that feels the, so kiddish. How? It's a kid's uh, movie. How but benign. It's, but it's not for kids either, though, because it's not cool at all. For its time. It's not very well, cool. It's not very cool, how, except for the time yeah. train. The, how benign the gun stuff is right. really stuck yes. out to me. Like, there are people shooting guns all over the place. Like, Marty McFly is, like, 
given a gun as a gift because he's so good at shooting guns. And that feels not, and how that's played as just like, there, that's not that's still not that perilous even though the stakes are death like it just feels very in 2020 that that like like my eyes went a little bit wide at like how casual the gunplay was right it's it's very much like this is a western so there will be guns but you're mm-hmm. right you're you're right but but it's also weird that it's a movie that's like on one level fundamentally obsessed with death like it's people trying to prevent deaths that are locked in like the time continuum right and on the other hand it's like you never feel like anyone's going to die from a gunshot uh it, it doesn't feel like there's that immediate threat of violence you know you feel more threat going over the ravine than mm-hmm. you do in the fights as much as this movie is centered around like the sort of high noon or high 10 shootout i do like that bit about uh, liking killing before or after breakfast <laughs> very funny little <laughs> that's the best part there. you get what that's about great. monday yeah. also the other though it's like what about monday monday will be fine you can kill him monday <laughs> like that that whole yeah. conversation <laughs> really funny they I, and all that stuff though i mean be, i think part of that feels like the whole movie is is based around them uh, trying to avoid that gunfight, right? So he sets right, the gunfight right. knowing I'm not going to be there then. So, like, there is just the danger of, like, this pistols at 7 a.m., 10 paces in the town square. You're just like, oh, that's never going to happen. So so it yeah. does kind of, like, evade that, and you you don't get the nerves of, like, oh, I hope that Marty McFly doesn't get shot in this duel. So there are two big deleted scenes from the franchise that have been on all the like releases they've done over the years that were cut because audiences found them upsetting. Mm -hmm. Like this is actually upsetting. It doesn't fit in with this movie. And it's kind of the same sequence happening twice in two and three. Uh, It's just interesting that both times they made this miscalculation. But in two, it's and you get the glimpse of this. Um uh, after Biff has returned uh, from the 50s uh, so that they, you know, the car isn't missing anymore, old Biff, and he's given the uh, uh, almanac to his younger self, there's the shot of, like, old Biff hiding behind the DeLorean as he sneaks away, and then you never see him again. And what they shot is he starts writhing in pain, and then he, he like holds up his hand and it's the the prom thing where he can see through his hand and you watch him slowly disappear from existence. But like Tom Wilson's really playing the suffering of it. <laughs> yes. And the idea is that oh. somehow the ripple effect of what he did resulted in, you know, him not living to this point. Or like at least a this painful operation. tearing apart of time. Right, right. And he was like, audiences just found it really upsetting. And they were also confused as to what exactly that was the cause and effect of. And we were like, we don't know. It's just something must have happened. So they cut that out. But then the even weirder example is there is a scene they shot that's burned into my memory, having watched it whenever the first DVD release came out of this movie, where uh, after that standoff, uh, with uh, Marshall Strickland and his son and Mad Dog and his gang. Uh, you know, when he sort of says to his son, like, discipline, look, see, they're discipline. It always works. There's some scene that's supposed to happen after, later that night, where they chase him down and murder him in cold blood in front of his son. <laughs> oh, and his son sits there over his father's dead body as they laugh and ride away. And, like, that's why he's in the movie, because it was supposed to be, aside from being, like, a cute little thing, that it's like, oh, look, they've always been the sort of authority figures in this town. They've always been the disciplinary figures. It's also supposed to be like, oh, this is how you know that Mad Dog's actually a threat, Mm -hmm. that he's actually dangerous. Your principal is a fucking asshole. (laughs) Right, and the scene just, like, does not feel like it belongs in a Back to the Future movie. There's uh, sometimes... This doesn't feel like the kind of movie that needs one scene of jarring violence to recontextualize no. everything else you're seeing. No, <laughs> no, it, it's like literally the little boy holding his father's bloody, you know, body, screaming like "Help, help!" as they ride away, and it like lingers on it for a while. Oof. I also, I mean, that character, 
the little boy is the father of Principal Strickland, right? Because otherwise, Principal Strickland is 87 years old. <laughs> yeah, in, sure. In the yes. 50s. I believe, yes. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah. I can't keep track of all the timing, all the generational right. stuff, but yes. There could so be, he's there could carried be on discipline. Like, and he, you know, this is right. the thing he passed it down. Right. It's a tradition. In fact. We, we maintain talk. order. Right. 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 The Strickland's like discipline. The Tannins like bullying. The McFly's <laughs> like being cowards. That's the thing. These movies are about these inescapable legacies. Doc Brown is just one guy always. Well, it's this weird thing they've talked about. Like they developed all this backstory for Doc Brown, but then they liked it being kind of mysterious, but that he comes from a lot of money. Like he was this great legacy family and he was the black sheep, like weirdo science kid. And then there's that thing where his house burned down that he Mm -hmm. now lives in the garage of what used to be the Brown estate. And it's unclear if he did that on purpose for the insurance money or if something went wrong, but it always was one of those corners I find kind of interesting of just like, who was he when he was like 20? What were his I love parents that, like, like? Cool, cool, um, aloof high school Marty McFly is at the same level socially as like that translates to adult who's burned down his family estate. Right. Like blue blood, black sheep. Yeah. Son. Yep. And that that's right. like as cool as one cool high school kid. Cause like you're never that cool when you're 16. So Griffin, would you want would you want like a young doc story? Yeah, there's wow. you know there's the video game they did some years ago that's pretty fun uh, that like Gail wrote and they got a lot of the original people back to do the voices uh, and that's about Marty going back to young Doc Brown during the Prohibition. It's like a gangster story, like a '30s gangster story with like I forget what his name is, but like. You know, uh, 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 triggers Tannen in mm-hmm. the pinstripe suit is that like bootlegging fun. in the town. It's pretty fun. And it's like Doc Brown, who's so scatterbrained as like a 20 year old. I think he works as a patent clerk and he like doesn't believe in himself as an inventor and everyone just thinks he's a fuck up. And Marty going back in time is the person who encourages him to like believe in his ideas and try to become an inventor rather than just approving other people's inventions. It's a nice little game. It's a nice little game. That's sweet. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think they also adapt as a comic book. So things that are cool that happen in this movie. BTTF3, if you will. Mm. BTTF3. Doc Brown invites the first ice cube maker. (laughs) Water is dirty. Fucking dirty as Everything is dirty. Everything is dirty. Yes. A lot of dirt. Spitting Um, out buckshot when he's eating dinner, right from the the game. Oh, yeah. Griff, do you have more? Uh, Marty, Marty maybe invents the moonwalk, uh, taking another piece of pop culture away from African Americans. Uh, that's, that's one moment, not even because of the Michael Jackson association, but that's like the one moment that feels a little bit like too shitty time travel comedy, you know? Like, I feel like Back to the Future always toes the right line of not doing like, Take my word for it. No one will ever buy a Pablo Picasso painting. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I feel like they do just the right amount of Clint Eastwood jokes in this. They just get away with it. But something about the moonwalk thing just feels a little bit, like, too cute for me. Yeah. There's stuff like that that feels like they're just trying to be like, well, we should, you know, we should do some of the fun tropes of the first movie again, right? Mm-hmm. Like, just, just to kind of, like give the audience some relief like give you know i don't know but the big thing we should talk about is is clara <laughs> that's that's what i was going to say like you know yes there's lots yeah. of cute little things but she's sort of the one successful new character that the sequels introduce right like two doesn't yes. really try to introduce a new character i mean sort of Elizabeth new versions sure. of right. characters right right yeah, yeah. but like Clara, it's not like Clara is a, you know, incredibly complicated character. Like the, no one in this movie is, uh, is particularly nuanced, but like, she's just a very sweet winning character from minute one. And, uh, like, you know, just gives the whole thing a little bit more weight. Well, uh, Mary Steenburgen is like one of the most sincere actors alive. Right. Uh, Which we love her so much in, in, uh, you know, kind uh, of movie. Well, Melvin and Howard. Well, book club, obviously book club as well. Yes. 
the upcoming book club too. Elf. <laughs> Zoe's uh, extraordinary playlist. The clubbing. Yes, yes. She's you know, great in everything. She's I haven't always watched uh, Zoe's extraordinary. Is it good? It's fun. I wish the musical stuff were a little more felt a little more like in re- in stride. It does mm. feel like, and we're gearing up to do a musical. Sure, number. right, right. right. Um, but it, but it's like pretty cool. I, I like kind of dipped in and out while my wife watched the whole thing, and she was like very, very taken with it, and I enjoyed all of it that I saw. Yeah, yeah, and just like, oh, right, she just was great on like four seasons of uh, Last Man on Earth. Like she's just great in everything. She's always great. She's a really smart casting choice for this, and you don't realize like, obviously Christopher Lloyd is just such a skilled actor and he was so much in this vein at the time playing like high energy lunatics you know Mm -hmm. uh that like to see that first scene where they start talking about science and christopher Mm -hmm. lloyd just like completely shifts gears and he's still doc brown it's not like he drops all recognizable qualities of the characters but you're like this is the first time doc brown has had like a human conversation with another person <laughs> really and it i think it's more impressive because she doesn't like come out of nowhere they call the shot at the beginning right yes. when they say yes. like his beloved clara and so you know that she's coming right. and you know that they're going to resist it so she has to be so winning and so yeah. it has to feel so authentic and organic that that you you along with marty like give up uh, trying to be like, no, 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 no. Right. We have to undo this because this means Doc's going to die. And also the 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 second uh, d- poll or the second like elevation of like, he's there, Doc's going to die in a week. He doesn't even know who Clara is and yes, yet he yeah. will be buried by his beloved Clara. Like that's how fucking mm-hmm. charming this person's got to be. Yeah. It's a one week romance. Mm-hmm. And Doc has already sa- he's already said like oh it doesn't matter I don't know any Claras so it doesn't matter and right. so I don't I don't believe in love you can't <laughs> fall in love with someone that quickly <laughs> right like it's a pretty beautiful setup in that way you know where they just lock you in to understand the timeline and the consequences and you don't think there's any way you would buy them uh, but she just is so fucking good such a smart casting choice I always liked that she got on the poster and like above the title billing, which apparently was a last second decision for them. Like it was in the last couple of months, they revised the poster and said like, you know what, let's add her on there. Um, But aside from the symmetry, the niceness of like the first movie is one, the second one is two people. The third one is three people. Right. It also feels like she makes herself the third most kind of important character in terms of agency in this franchise. Well, Biff, I think Biff has to be number three. Because you got all the Biffs. You got all the Biffs, though. Yeah. I, I, what I'm saying is I feel like the Clara of Biff, Biff, everyone else is so beholden to the timeline, you know, even though Biff is the one who disrupts it with the, the fucking book. Right. I'm saying like Clara is very much an independent thinker. She feels like your your big third hero alongside yes. Marty. I had Doc. always figured she got on the poster just because she has an Oscar. Like that, that kind of just kind of gets yeah. you extra weight in terms of the poster. But that's cool. Good for her. I was looking through like a, a Back to the Future book and it had like all the different drafts of the posters and how they were planning on doing totally different things for the two and three posters. Like it's one of the mm-hmm. best ideas this franchise had. Uh the the final poster for the first movie they landed on like two months before it came out. There are like Such eighty a poster. different poster designs that are all good and taglines that are good, but none of them would have had the same impact and it probably the movie would not have been such a big hit and then for the second one they were like we don't want to repeat the same image and then they landed on it at the last second because they were like fuck nothing else working we'll just do the same thing but with them coming out of the car with the future clothes and then three was the same thing and they added her at the last second right i'm looking Um, originally it was going to be the bear it was going to be the bear. It was, was going to be the bear was the third. Bart was yeah, just going to just going to have the whole poster. <laughs> Marty Doc Bart. I'm the seeing bear. I'm seeing one Griff like one concept art where he was like on a a watch like Marty is sitting on a stopwatch yes. essentially, right? He's like kneeling on it. I get it. I mean I have a l- I have a little segment I want to do at the end of this episode about about the posters that could have been. Wow. 
Okay, I'm excited. Just a little, um, just a little segment. Just a little yeah. seggy. No, I get you. I get you. Just a All little right. seggy. Um, um, yeah. But but I, I think it is, you know, the fact that she is such an honest actor helps this character avoid being Manic Pixie Dream Teacher, especially yes. because, as you said, Josh, they've called their shot. Like, the movie is telling you in advance, you have to believe that this is that great of a love that could, you know, yeah. move mountains that in that short a time um and it it also just is so nice where you're like doc and marty are friends but doc is always kind of just talking at people yeah like doc is always just kind of monologuing his own understanding of what's going on around him and thinking out loud and then when clara like asks him about science it's like oh this is the first time he's like slowed down and spoken at a normal human volume. Yeah. And, like, it's the first time like that right. aren't urgent. When he says, like, I'm a student of all sciences, you're kind of like, I guess he so is. Sweet. Like you hadn't thought about that before. Right. And that he's assumed this defensive position his entire life. You know, like I uh, you know, on top of him being this disgraced member of his, like, elite blue blood family. Also, the fact that he's, like, constantly having to outrun Libyan terrorists and shit. Like, <laughs> he's very much this renegade outlaw scientist. And it feels like he has no allies in the town to the degree that his only friend is a kid who likes his gadgets. You know, but Marty never seems interested in science. He never gets the fourth dimension thing. The thing about, though, Doc being an old guy is they get away with it being chill for kids and fun. But now it's yeah. about, like, love and this old guy, like, fucking, you know? It's weird. That's what I always remembered as a kid, just being like, I don't know if I want to know about this adult romance. I wasn't into it. You didn't want to think about Doc Brown getting some. No. Fair enough. It's so chaste, though. They, like, kiss... It is very chaste. ...on their horses under the stars, and there's, like, a shooting star that flies by them. It feels, like, so, so Disney. It's also so sweet when Doc... Just to see Christopher Lloyd see her on the train at the end of the movie oh. and light up. Like, you know, yeah. he just plays that so perfectly. It, it definitely feels like, to some degree, the conception of this movie was, let's like give Christopher Lloyd a gift for doing all the heavy lifting on these last two films. Right. And right, also right. because now we probably doomed him to playing this type of character for the rest of his career. <laughs> like <laughs> let's, this is the one circumstance in which we can get a studio to give us tens of millions of dollars to have Christopher Lloyd be a romantic lead <laughs> as an adult elderly man, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's nice. He's just such a good fucking actor. He's great. He is. Even just like the final time train speech, the thing I butchered at the beginning of this is so like, and if you dream it, you can make it happen. You know, it's like so like when you wish upon a star kind of stuff. But he he really you you feel like he believes what he's saying at all times. It's a very earnest movie. It's very Still, earnest, like, yeah. right? From yep. top to bottom. I mean, this is a movie where taking one shot of whiskey makes you fall unconscious because it's a great that scene. Joke got me. I, that joke gets yeah. you. How many drinks has he had? And you go, they go, that's the first one. The whiskey does I though laughed. like smoke when it pour like spills out. So like they're <laughs> making that whole like it's so strong joke, which is really funny right. Too. Right. Because it's like the Wild West. So like God knows right. what they're actually drinking. But like Christopher Lloyd is one of the funniest physical actors. Like, I mean, he's got yes. Adam's family values coming up a couple years after that. Like he can sell just falling over like that better than anyone. Oh what, man! What a fainty franchise! It really is just they rely on the faints so much, but but they're always good. They have good. Committed but you actors. know what? Those are things. When I saw these movies when I was a kid, I figured people fainted all the time. I figured that yes. calling someone a chicken mm -hmm. was like a fucking slur because the way sure. that it's treated in this movie, I was like, "Geez, you really can't call someone that." Like there were all these lessons I, mean, I learned from this movie that don't matter. Marty McFly reacts to being called a chicken as almost as if it, someone had called him Karen. The worst thing you could right. ever well, call a person. And then and then a few years later, you get that that memorable scene in Pulp Fiction. Does Marcellus Wallace look like a chicken? And I think that they really drove it home. Yeah. Yeah. What if what if Doc showed up at the end of Back to the Future one? He's like, Marty, it's your kids. One of them's a Karen. We got to get to the future right now. She was at the mall yelling at someone. She 
He's a Karen, Molly! <laughs> <laughs> Bring, bring. Oh, the phone. Okay. Okay, I'm picking up the phone. Click. Hello. Hey, butthead. Oh, hello. That's not a very nice way to start a phone call. Yeah, well, why don't you make like a tree and hang up? I see. You're the legendarily irascible Biff Tannen? Butthead. Is that who I'm talking to? Yeah. Well, okay. How are you doing, Biff? Thanks for calling, I guess. Not great, butthead. Uh, why not? What's wrong? by some old man gave me an almanac told me I had to bet on horse races sure said he was me sure sure right classic told situation told me I was gonna become a billionaire right, right it was awful why was it awful that sounds like a windfall uh hello because he was bald oh I see you got a chilling vision of your future yeah and maybe a, a little light on top well, all right, look, I know a lot of our identity is wrapped up in our hair. And when you get into your 20s or 30s, you start noticing the first signs of hair loss, or maybe you're visited by yourself as an old man. Yeah. It can feel like panic time. But Biff, thankfully, now there's keeps. It's the simple and easy way to keep your hair. Okay? Two out of three guys are going to experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. So nothing to be ashamed of, but... The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair. You're telling me the future is what we make of it? The future uh, is not your sure. I mean, yeah, sure, right. And, and, you know, I mean, maybe that wasn't true back when you had to go to the doctor's office and get your hair loss prescription. But now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get hair loss medication delivered right to your house. They make it easy and deliver your medication every three months. So you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines, awkward doctor visits, confusing time travel conversations. That sounds great, butthead. Those are three of my least favorite things in the world. Here's one thing, though, Biff. Keeps treatments typically take between four to six months to see results. So it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you're going to save. And they've got more five-star reviews than any competitor. So their treatments just start at $10 a month, and you can get your first month free. So... You know, let's get moving, Biff. Yeah, fine. I mean, I'm good at going fast. I, I got a car and everything. Follow you do up have question. a question. Right. Do you know sure. anyone who's good at getting manure out of uh, car interiors? Yeah, that's uh, definitely not keeps, I guess, because okay. they're, they're going to keep it in there. But, right, uh, no, I want to get rid of it. Right, and probably a company called RID. Uh, would the be hair, the manure. <laughs> right. Well, okay, look, if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, you can go to yeah. keeps.com slash check to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash check. Keeps dot com slash check. This is the most popular company. They've got all these before and after shots I'm looking at in my ad copy here. Some oh thick God. heads of hair. Wait a second, butthead. Mm. Look at this picture I have of me as an old man. It's changing. It's changing. You did it. You're going to do keeps. Oh, I got it's morphing. Box now, butthead. That kind of track, <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you for calling, Biff. I feel like this has been very productive. Yeah, now I'm going to hang up in 1955 where I somehow have the technology to zoom into your podcast. Uh, yeah, blank check can be zoomed from any time, I guess. That's how it works. Uh, can we talk about the biggest performance in this movie, the most important performance in this movie? Uh, sure. A little three-person collective I call ZZ Top. I don't know what other people call them, but I like to call them ZZ Top. Yeah, that's what you call them, right? For the listeners, it is ZZ Top. It's not someone else Griffin no. is calling ZZ Top. No, nope. no, I'm calling. Z <laughs> I'm not calling Elizabeth True ZZ Top. Yeah, it'd be, yeah, it'd be yeah, weird. Yeah, if, all, right. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah. Uh, Flee the other guys in the car at the end, the other guys in the truck at the end. I, I could be calling him ZZ Top, but I'm not. I refer, of course, to Billy Gibbons. And the other two members Dusty of Dusty Hill mm -hmm. and hilariously, Hill. as everyone knows, Frank Beard, the drummer who doesn't have a beard. He's the one who doesn't uh, have a beard. The beardless one. Uh, the only problem with ZZ Top being in this movie is that they sh it, you just wish they were in all three. That this movie had yes. pulled the same trick with them where they play different you know instruments in different time <laughs> periods. That'd be fun. The the ZZ Top song 
gets billing in the opening credits. Mm. Which Huey Lewis does as well. It was Double like a back. rare time where, right, if you wrote a big song for a movie, you get opening billing. Yes. Um, it was, I don't know why, maybe it's like the Top Gun soundtrack star. I'm trying to remember like what movie would have kicked that off where it's like, Maybe like Footloose, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, right? Like it is such oh, yeah. an '80s thing. Like I, the Tiger, the Rocky movies, do it. You know, mm-hmm. ba- Batman has a songs by Prince credit. Well, he did a right, whole album. Yeah, right. no, no. But I'm just saying in the opening credits, like this has that thing where it's like double back, written and performed by ZZ yep. Top. Like right. the opening credits mm-hmm. gives you the title of the song. Yeah. And um, like, oh, double back. This must be this song. I, I'm, it's going to be an all-time classic. Is it the, lame? The legend. To, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I want to hear what you're going to say. Is it lame to say that ZZ Top is like a genuinely great group and I have several of their albums and I actually listen to them? Ben Wayne. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Thank this you very much. This is my thing. John Glazer has that My Dead Dad Was in ZZ Top bit that is probably <laughs> oh, one of yes. my five favorite comedy bits of all time. It's, it's it's one of the things I've been most influenced by my entire life. It it has made it almost impossible for me to take ZZ Top seriously <laughs> because every yeah. time I see them, I hear them, I think about them, the first thing that comes to mind is, you guys all suck. The baseline for Tush sucks. I just constantly think about that final moment where he reads the list of insults to them. Uh, if people haven't heard it, uh, look it up. It was on the Invite Them Up album. He wrote a book uh, called My Dead Dad Was in ZZ Top that included that as an essay. But it is a bit in which John Glazer's father has died. And when he goes to settle his estate, he finds a box containing letters that reveal that his dad was the original keyboardist for ZZ Top. <laughs> and the letters outline how he ended up leaving the band and it's it's the it's the greatest it's the greatest but i just i always i always think about that apparently zemeckis was a big zz top fan asked them to be like the huey lewis for the movie because two doesn't have any original songs and the huey lewis songs were so big in the first one and you have huey lewis doing a cameo you have like there's a music video for power of love that has christopher lloyd and huey lewis in it like they were really all in on the synergy of that so he was like zz top would be a fun one for the western thing they asked if they could come visit set and then when they were on set they were like can you please put us in the movie their whole argument was we look we look picture ready. Like you can just put us in front of the camera. So they were not planned to be in the movie. And you know, there's the thing where like, if you're shooting concert scenes or club scenes or party scenes, anything with music in a movie and you have that many extras and there's dialogue over it, they never actually play the music for real unless it's just like the close up shot of the instrumentation or whatever, because it's an editing nightmare uh, with continuity of just different versions of the song, having to stitch together takes. There's this one moment that I'm just obsessed with. And as a kid, I feel like from the first time I saw this movie on VHS, I rewound it over and over and over again. Um, Because there's famously the thing at the end with the time train where one of Doc Brown's kids points at his dick which I feel like has now become a big urban legend and memed a lot. It, 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 the kid, like, like with his hand, does, like, a come here <laughs> gesture and then points directly at his penis and then I think grabs it. And the thought is that he was telling his parents off camera that he had to go to the bathroom. Right. But the kid looks like a little stinker and it ends up being this, like, hey, get a load of this. Like, it feels very, like, Beetlejuicey. In like a provocateur moment. I'm trying now. I'm watching. I've heard, of course I've heard this before, but I'm trying to remember. It's is it the second kid? I'm looking. I'm watching. It's the littler kid. It's, it's the, littler the littler kid, kid who it's, looks it's Vern. devilish. Vern. Oh right, right. But but the moment that I've always been obsessed with is it's like the the mayor of Hill Valley comes back after the fight has been you know at least put off for a couple of days and he's like okay everybody okay everybody let's get back to partying or whatever and then zz top does that move where they spin their instruments yes classic which i guess is something from their live performances that zemeckis thought would be funny to have them do in this movie so they jerry-rigged these things to make the drums and the guitars spin around But then when they stop the spinning and they start playing again, it is so clear that they are not playing their instruments that he (laughs) told them, like, you can't play it for real for sound reasons. And they're so 
bad for professional rock stars who had been together for like almost, you know, 20 plus years at that point. They are so bad at miming their instruments that their hands are like inches away. And the one guy, <laughs> as he's strumming on the guitar, just goes like this. He just opens and closes his palm in front of the spring of the strings. And the other guy just kind of goes like like this, like he just kind of wiggles it. But they both are like it's it's so clear, like they weren't supposed to be in the movie. There wasn't much rehearsal time. They pitched it to him. Zemecca said, why not? They spent more energy trying to get the spinning rig going. They put them on camera. They got two takes. And I'm seemingly the only person who's ever like even watching it today. I rewound it six times. I find it <laughs> so funny how <laughs> off the mark they are. I noticed it today for the first time. It's very funny. It's very I yeah. Right, it's they're great. way way off. It's almost like purposefully bad. It looks like actors playing musicians <laughs> who have never held an instrument before. And so it's weirder that it's guys who are not actors who play instruments for a living. Because they just can't fake it. They can't act. They can't act. And David, I guess ZZ Top is just so fucking real. They can't give you no bullshit. Oh, God, it's so cool when they swing the guitars around, though. I'm watching it again now. This is I'm just having a blast. And it's cutting to, like, Bob Gale explaining something about CC <laughs> Top. I guess about whatever, like, rigs they, you know, had to wear to spin the guitars. Um... <sighs> God, ZZ Top should be in more movies. They should like be in the MCU or something. Are they still hanging out? Do they like Trump or something? Am I going to get bummed out right now? I, have I shouldn't a even. They I do. Don't... <laughs> so well, no. hold on, hold on. We can't. Let's not. Let's not say they do have real Trumpy faces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can't. We can't judge a, a ZZ Top by their cover. Uh, Wait a second. I don't know. Wait a They're second. So close Wait a... to Ted Nugent. I mean, it, he, uh... I'm. I feel pretty confident. David. David. Yeah. November 9th. 2018 headline ZZ Top's Billy Gibbons fires his opener for wearing a Make America Great Again hat. There you go. There right, you go. I was wrong. All right. Thank you, Billy Gibbons. So, all right. Plot stuff, guys. I mean, he gets dragged by Biff, oh, who's riding a horse. Yeah. Yeah. Where's that? That's no good. There's, there's Doc's unpleasant. cool. There's Doc's cool gun. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like all of Doc's inventions. It's the best joke in, dare I say it, A Million Ways to Die in the West. Oh, the Jesus. Western comedy. Fucking hell. You're canceled it's for got, bringing that up. It's got one. It's got <laughs> one good joke where Seth MacFarlane is like running away from Liam Neeson or something, and he hides out in a barn and then turns around, and it's Christopher Lloyd working on the DeLorean. And he's like, oh, duh, wah, and then puts the tarp on top of it. That sounds like a terrible That's joke. Fun. I think it's funny. I like it. <laughs> you just like Back to the Future and you're an easy fucking mark. Admit it. Correct. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> the easiest. Oh, God. I, I mean, I'm watching it and I'll say Lloyd is committed. I'm watching the clip. That's right what's this fun second. about it. Right. Lloyd yeah. like, basically the still looks of the, the reveal same. Is good. Right. And it's nice that they got a real, the real Christopher Lloyd instead of having someone dressed as him where you only kind of see the, yeah, that the would hair blow. and the jacket. Yeah. Right. Or like some epic movie shit where it's like a mad TV cast member playing him. I hate to right. dig into this, but that's another example of a movie where it's like Seth MacFarlane has, as Seth MacFarlane has this big hit with Ted and they're like, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to do a Western comedy. Like, again, Hollywood would yeah. never be like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. No. They let him do it because he just made a hit. But like, it, it's so funny how many of these guys just go to that well where they're like, well, I love a Western. Let's let we can we can do it. We'll do this genre right. It'll be a hit. There's a certain type of nerd who loves Westerns. Uh, I also think you're not mentioning the crazier part of A Million Ways to Die in the West, which is Ted is this humongous hit and he's like, OK, it's a comedy Western. And they go, great. Who are you thinking for the lead? You want to bring Wahlberg back? Is there anyone else? He's like, no, I'm the guy now. <laughs> he really he really uh, put himself front and center in a way yeah. that like. Um, and unless he was already making zillions of dollars for the the company, they'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? He it's, hosted the Oscars. I know. It's a wild thing. It's also wild that like... That's, I forgot about that. He made so much money for Fox, right, with his shows. 
Sure. And then he's like, I'm finally ready to make a movie. Here you go, Ted. And it feels like that's the kind of thing where the studios go, look, you've been so big for us, whatever it takes to make you happy. And Fox was like, fuck you, that sounds dumb. Like, we're not making your goddamn teddy bear movie. And then Universal made it and made so much goddamn money. And he was like, smell you later. Well, now I'm a Universal movie guy. Universal, here we go. Two more movies coming. And then Ted 2 bombed and A Million Ways to Die in the West bombed. Yeah. Ted 2 bombed. I mean, and then he was like, okay, I guess I'll bring back Cosmos and I'll do a Star Trek show that I will pretend is a comedy, but immediately reveal not is a not a comedy. That's it's the weirdest just Star thing Trek. in the world. Right. Yes. right. That everyone was like, it's a parody. And he's like, I told them it was a parody right. so they would let me make it. And after episode two, <laughs> there are no more jokes ever again. Right. <laughs> It's literally just him being like, I get that they don't want to make Star Trek like I love it, which is just like people on a ship, you know, having adventures episode by episode. But damn it, I'll do it. Like, I don't care. Like, I, I'll just. He like tricked them into doing <laughs> Yes. But, but also, also, even if it were still a parody, it were what he sold them originally. The pitch of. It's a Star Trek parody, and I get to play Captain Kirk this time. Right. <laughs> it's wild. They're like, they're like, wait a minute. You're a TV star? And he's like, I, I, yeah. Uh, I am not? now, because I, I just decided and, I am. And I fucking sing. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Right. That's the other yeah. thing. And yeah, and I'm going to be America's 21st century Sinatra. You are? Yeah, I am. Fuck you. Who says no? American yeah, Dad I, is I still on. I had a Grammy-nominated album. I had a Grammy nominated album called Music is Better Than Words. You did? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, I'm Seth MacFarlane. Nothing I've done makes sense. <laughs> Does Seth MacFarlane have the biggest blank check in show business? Tell me how many albums he's released, Griffin. Just give me a, just guess a number. Six. Six. Six albums. How did you know that? I had a feeling. Five team seemed too few, seven seemed too many. <laughs> Seven, yeah, seven's gauche. Yeah, seven's seven's gotta be. Seth Come McFarlane, on. it feels less like a blank check than a heat check. Does that make sense, David? I yes. know you're, you're uh, a basketball yes, Josh, guy. Yes. We're, so, thank you. We are two basketball thank fans. You. It's exactly what it is because he, even with the bounces, like he still always has the you know the constant revenue stream of the two cartoons. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so he'll mm -hmm. just every so often he'll throw one up, like you know you know what I mean, like. Well, yeah, sci-fi yeah. show, like, you know, like, you know, uh, jazz albums. And yeah. I don't know, like, are the jazz albums successful? Maybe they are. Like, what's it, what's the ceiling of success on a jazz album anyway? You know, Who it's not like these things that need to... music? That right, it's not like these things sick. need to sell, like, a billion records, right? Like, you know, he... he that, he's, that's no. the thing. It's like, I, I bet Seth MacFarlane's jazz albums are amongst the highest-selling jazz albums of the last 10 years, just because he got more press sure. than any other jazz album does, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't... Yeah. I Look, look. It, we should we should wrap up the episode of a back. We can't get into the economics of jazz album releasing in the 21st century. I feel like it's just there's a lot to dig into. Right. I don't have a lot you're of right. research on this. It's a David, fascinating topic. David, you're right. We can't get into it. That's absolutely Patreon content. That right, is right. <laughs> we do all, all six content. Seth MacFarlane jazz albums back to back. Yeah. What if every we announce week, no, we were doing... Every week, no, it goes on the main feed. <laughs> every week, you do the top five Billboard jazz albums after you do the box office right, game. Right, right. Yeah, let's check the, the Billboard jazz charts right now. <laughs> we announce we're doing a Seth MacFarlane miniseries, except main feed is just the albums and Patreon is the movies. <laughs> Man, I mean, Jesus, the fucking number one... You know who's number one on the Billboard jazz chart right now? Seth MacFarlane. No, Frank Sinatra. Good for him. He's really? Fucking, he's fucking <laughs> killing it. Number two is Nora Jones. Number three is Miles Davis. They don't fuck around. <laughs> it's just the Kings. <laughs> Michael Buble is fourth. And number five I Buble was up is there. Louis Armstrong. It's five people. Wow. You're like, sure. There you go. Well, like, okay, here's the thing. I'm looking at chart positions for his first album. Music is better than words. U.S. Billboard 200, peak position 111. Peak on position the on the jazz, 200? on the Billboard 200, all around. Peak position on the jazz chart, too. Number two. It didn't hit the number so one spot, be. though. 
I, but it probably was Sinatra. I was going to say, it's probably not a modern day artist who's beating him. He's probably just constantly in Sinatra's shadow. He came at the king and he missed. He did. Mm-hmm. That's how Seth MacFarlane thinks of Seth MacFarlane. Like, I'm just constantly in Frank Sinatra's shadow. <laughs> like, what a what an image of yourself. It's yes. a he, it's, he's, he's living heat check. He's Dion Waiters. He is Dion he's Waiters. Like, who, Josh, do you know, will win a ring this year? No matter what, because he's on both teams that are in the finals this year. No. Oh, right. I forgot he that. Started th- this was still the season right. where he had, took that edible on the flight and freaked out and got suspended. Yes. He started the year on the heat, took an edible, freaked out on an airplane, got fired, and now plays for the Lakers. This is the year of Dion Waiters. Yes. He won 2020. He won 2020. What a, what a victory. Good job, Dion. I know. For the listener at home, Griffin just fled the the Zoom call when you guys started talking Without about a basketball. Word. Yeah, just disappeared. I'm sorry I hijacked your podcast where you guys know things and are funny and smart just to talk about the NBA Finals. It's quite all right. I love to talk Josh, about the NBA Finals. Griffin's back. Not the first time, won't be the last. I used that uh, <laughs> moment when I would have nothing to contribute as an opportunity to get the thing I wanted for the final segment. I do okay. want to point out, uh, because you made your Sinatra joke, uh, Josh, on uh, Seth MacFarlane's Wikipedia, he points out that he trained with Sally Sweetland, who worked with Sinatra as a vocal coach, and he bought Frank Sinatra's microphone that he used on most of his albums. Oh, that's just And that's creepy. what he records on and uses for live shows. That's that's wow. weird. That he used it for live shows? I believe so. It would, it would be better if he recorded Peter Griffin's voice in that microphone. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> And and he records on analog tape. Wow. The jazz or family yes. guy? Seth MacFarlane is the Christopher Nolan of modern jazz. He wants everything <laughs> the way he grew up the, with it. He's the um Tim Heidecker, I think you should leave Gary. Right. Who's yes. Dave Ronk? Yes. <laughs> or whatever. It is. Dan <laughs> Anyway, Griff. Back to the future part three. Is there anything else we want to talk about except for the final train sequence, which is so Good. Um, Doc buries a car, which is cool. You just appreciate that he buried something. Yeah, I think that rules. <laughs> right, right. I also just like that it's such a like a, a tiny little clever time travel thing of like, oh, if you're trapped in the past, you can just leave something in a place where no one will find it for 100 years and write them a letter. Similar cute time travel thing. Marty showing up, Doc saying, who dressed you like that? And Marty saying, you did. Always, <laughs> always <laughs> like fun. Cute joke. Always fun. Yeah, so Ben, if you had a DeLorean, you could bury jeans, go 100 years in the future, (laughs) unbury the jeans there. They'd be 100-year-old jeans, and then bring them back to the present. Those would be worth so much. Yeah, those are yeah hyper-buried jeans. (laughs) It'd be great. (laughs) Um, But yeah, no, I just love the final trains. Maybe I'm just a sucker for trains, but I'm just into repeating the stakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. The stakes are fun. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, it's the classic Zemeckis stuff of just like it excels because it's so well defined. You understand exactly what needs to happen, how, at what moment, where everything is in relation to everything else. They've gone over it so many times. Um, and it's once you have like Clara on the side of the train, it feels like them riffing on Buster Keaton too, like them doing the general thing. I also love that they keep the hoverboard and play but they don't overuse it in this movie you reestablish mm-hmm. it at the beginning when you have that shot of him like napping with his feet up on the hoverboard and then they hold off on it for long enough that you forget that it's even a tool and it's so exciting when they're able to use that to save a life at the end um mm-hmm. but it's sweet i remember as a kid genuinely believing that doc and clara had died uh-huh. that they had gone over the cliff uh and thought oh this franchise just ends on a very bittersweet note Mm-hmm. Uh, boy gets his four by four, loses his best friend. Um, but uh, but the the end stuff is nice. I mean, it's like right you you have the needle scene, and then you have the lovely uh, uh, Doc Brown coda. Yeah, both of those scenes work for me. I just like Marty being chill, being like, "Why would I race that asshole?" Like, I, I just yeah. that's a nice that, little coda to that. And then the time train, I'm just so into the time train. No, I'm sorry. What do you want to say about I was just going to say it super works. Like it is the like it is the even more believable than anything in the Wild West when he's like, I don't have to like race these dudes. You get the feeling of like, 
oh, he's like made that progress right. that we're yes. we're supposed to where this is we're buying in that this is his uh, evolution as a character. Definitely. I, as much as the chicken stuff is not very gracefully worked into these two movies, it does pay off there. Like that is the mm-hmm. moment you want of of that much shoehorning. Um, yep. But just the, everything about the time train rules. Uh, yep. Doc and Clara's outfits rule. That they name their kids Jules and Vern rules. The Clara's last name. Uh, Ravine changing to Eastwood Ravine. Love that. Love that. Did you see that, David? Uh, Yes. Yeah. No, that's yes. I I love all those little jokes. Yeah. Love how many times the Ravine changed his name. But the final Eastwood gag is really good. Uh, But just that final, like the train looks cool when it comes in and you see all the gears moving. And then the moment when you realize the train can fucking fly when it goes into the hover wheel position. Yeah, it's cool. Also, when the DeLorean gets hit by the train and then they like end up going back. Like, I love the logic. It's like cartoon logic of like no like police have shown up. Like no one's been called to the scene. Trains just go through, hit stuff and keep going. I think that's very right. funny. Right. It it enters the grease pantheon of a film that ends with a non-flying form of transportation taking flight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the the best pantheon. Here's a little uh, a little thing I want to do because I forgot to do this in our three hour episode on the first movie. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> that episode was I will point out slightly longer than the film Back to the Future. <laughs> it was significantly uh, about an hour longer. longer. Yeah. Uh, so I was looking. This was like the book that came with the the 30th anniversary Blu-ray set. There's a new set coming out now. Uh, I will rebuy these movies for like the fifth fucking time. Um, But uh, they have all these rejected poster concepts in here, which are all good, but it just made me think like, this is just such a fucking striking image. It's such a good image. so much of it is just the the colors and the posing and his expression. You don't, it doesn't really tell you what you need to know about the movie, but it definitely makes you intrigued. It draws you in. And I heard Zemeckis say, like, the best thing a poster can do is sell you on the mood of a movie. And the poster definitely does that. These other ones do not. And it also feels like I feel it would have made its legacy far more of, like, teen comedy rather than what's thought of as, like, family, you know, sci-fi comedy adventure kind of movies. So this one is, like, Marty... Hey, let me turn off my virtual background so yeah, you can yeah. see this. Um, but I'll describe them as well. So it's like Marty hanging 10 on like a clock and it, it, his family and his friends are like on there, right? Yeah. And he's like holding on to it like he's surfing the clock. And the tagline is, Marty McFly has broken the time barrier and he's got just one week to get it fixed. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's a little convoluted. It feels a little bit like the the text on the front of like a, not a Goosebumps book, but the adventure analog of that. Yes, yes. Great take. Great take. Absolutely. Okay, so this is the next one. It's it's the one I think you were talking about, uh, David, where he's mm-hmm. trapped like in the clock. Um, so you can see here, he's in like the face of the clock looking at his, his parents uh, yes. shocked. And the tagline is, 17-year-old Marty McFly got home early last night. 30 years early. I, I mean, I, I hear it's not wrong. He did get home 30 years early. The point of this segment is I want to underline how close movies come to not becoming iconic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even you pointed this you pointed this out on the original Back to the Future episode a couple weeks ago, but Back to the Future as the title is like kind of a bit, right? Like until you see the movie, you can only really imagine. And as someone who worked for five years on a TV show whose name was a bit, Mm -hmm. uh, people don't remember it until it becomes a thing that is like part of their regular life. Like people, when I worked at Last Week Tonight, people would be like, oh, I love that show This Week with John Oliver. Like just got it wrong constantly (laughs) because the name is a bit, not like an intuitive description of a thing. Now I want to find what it was because it's like a legendary story that uh, they hated the title. Oh, you're talking about the like Spaceman from Mars thing? Right, right. Yes, that's what it is. Right, right. It was uh, Ned Tannen was the name of the executive at Universal who wanted them to call it Spaceman from Pluto or whatever it is after the book. I'm going to look it up exactly because it's so funny. He wrote this memo that is so demented that Steven Spielberg responded to it by being like, that was a very funny joke. And the guy couldn't (laughs) 
couldn't call it out. I couldn't be like, I was serious because Steven Spielberg had just been like, right. well, uh, okay. Like, you know, it's Sid Sheinberg. It, it, that was Sid Sheinberg who was their supporter. Ned Tannen was a guy who worked at Universal and I think fucked over Zemeckis on I Want to Hold Your Hand, which is why the Tannen family has that name in the movies. Right. It's it, 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 You're right, Griff. It's Spaceman from Pluto. And yes. he's like, I think this title's no good. Uh, it doesn't sound like a genre movie. I think it needs a better title. We should call it Spaceman from Pluto. You'll just have her refer to him as a spaceman from Pluto instead of like Darth Vader or whatever that joke is. And so that's how you get that into the movie. And then it sounds like an old fashioned science fiction flick. So problem solved. And Spielberg replied with like great joke memo. And Sig Chamberg yeah. just was like, didn't bring it up again. Spielberg like laid it on thick. He said like, Sid, we, uh, as you know, no time is more stressful than the couple of weeks leading into production of the movie. For that, I must thank you for giving us such a great laugh right. in the offices of Back to the Future. <laughs> you really helped take the, like he just fucking embarrassed the guy so hard because he was like, that's the only way he'll back down from this. Uh, other taglines, I'm just going to speed round through these. This poster is just the three feet of, of George and Lorraine and Marty. Like it, uh, where is it here? Uh, oh yeah, there they are. There. And it's standing there. Marty McFly has just come between the most unlikely couple in high school. His parents. Like it makes you realize how hard it is to sell the premise of this movie uh, because it is guy tries to not fuck his mom. Very take my wife, please. But it's like, fuck my mom, please. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> please don't fuck my mom. Or no, I guess he is saying to Sid his dad. Sid Schaberg's other suggestion for the title was fuck my right. mom, please. <laughs> yes. We've got a PG movie called <laughs> fuck my mom, please. Um, let's oh do the boy. box office game. Yeah. All right. This so is the one back to the future not to make a hundred million. Is that right? It makes... 88 domestic. That's yeah. right. Uh, 244 worldwide. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like, I don't even know if Universal uh, would have been like, let's definitely make a fourth anyway. Right. Like, I know the movie's kind of wrapping up here, but yeah. like, it wasn't a huge enough thing for them to be like, Bobby, have you got any other ideas? Like, you know. First one was the highest grossing movie of its year. Someone did the math. It would have made like 900 million it domestic was, right. in It was like a dollars. hit beyond all measure. Yes. Right. Second one's a huge hit, but a major drop off. And yeah. then the third one like performed okay. And uh, I'm sorry, I found the one other tagline I want to call out. Go ahead. Uh, Marty McFly's dropping in to surprise his parents. The surprise is that it's 13 years before he'll be born. All right. That's so sweaty. We get but it. Like, it's all earlier. All these are so sweaty. <laughs> yeah. That's so sweaty. Right. Ugh. The time one, I just love that the, the poster and the tagline they ended up with don't allude to the parent shit at all. It's just like, who's this young kid who can travel through time, apparently? Right. Yeah, that's cool. Right. Right. Yeah. He doesn't What's need cooler to. Than why that? does he want to see his parents? <laughs> right, right. Kid hangs out with parents is like such a weird pitch for a movie. Yeah. It also just made the mistake like of the Matrix movie, you know, like, you know, the back to back sequel thing where they're really close together. You don't get to build up anticipation. I think that rarely works. Like, it's not usually what people want. No. And people were very critical of the fact, like, I remember as a kid reading old Mad Magazines, they would do so many bits in like those couple of years about like. Oh, Hollywood's so bankrupt, they put the trailer for the next movie before the first one's even ended. Like, right. everyone was ragging right. on there the fact go. that there was the preview and the uncredits of this. It saved them a lot of money doing it this way, and obviously, like, cast availability. Yeah. But then no one really attempted it again until Matrix, then Pirates of the Caribbean, and now, obviously, it happens somewhat more often. Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, Marvel movies yeah. shooting back-to-back. -back. yeah. Uh, but it's still often not the best strategy. All right. So it opens number one. Now, the thing, Griffin, is that this is the week before Total Recall. Ooh. Um, wow. So some of these movies were in that box office game. But number one, okay. Back but to that the was Future Part 3. Some time ago as well. It was. Yeah. Number two, it's just I'm, these movies Does are it, kind of obscure I'm, and I remember us talking about them. Go ahead. What? What is it? What, what we, I'm sorry. Just what's the weekend again? What's the opening weekend gross on Back to the Future? <laughs> May 25th, 1990, it opens at $23 million. Okay. Number okay. two was number okay. one before. It's two movie stars, a man and a woman, build above the title with their first names. Bird on a Wire? Bird on a Wire. Mel and Goldie. Mel and Goldie. Um, which I've never seen. Uh, me neither. 
I've also never seen it. Number three at, in the box office is one of the biggest hits of 1990. Was it the biggest? I think no. Because the biggest movie in 1990, as far as I know, is Home Alone. Yeah, correct. Well, no, it's actually not if you go worldwide. Do you know what's number one if you go worldwide? Oh, Ghost. boy. Mr. Worldwide over here. Suddenly, I'm, I'm talking Ghost. about Pitbull. But come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Griffin, thank you for saying that. You're welcome. You're very welcome, Josh. I knew you <laughs> would like that joke. I don't know if I'd make I it don't with a know if I, I don't know if I'm empowered to assign comedy points, but if you, I were, of course you are. I would assign them to you. Of course you are. Are you kidding me? It means the world to me. Griffin, that's five comedy points to you, buddy. Was it Josh is right? Ghost. Is it Ghost? Ghost is the number one movie. Well, he said it. I only said it because David said it already. Yeah. Okay. It's just wild to think that Ghost was... The, the biggest movie. I mean, obviously, Ghost was a phenomenon. Um, anyway, yep. but this is the third biggest. So those two are the top movies in 1990. This is the next one. Another colossal star-making phenomenon, the likes of which we'll never see again. Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts. And number four uh, worldwide that year is Dances with Wolves. And number five is Total Recall. Back to the Future Part 3 is wow. sixth biggest movie okay. of the year. Um Okay, number four is, um, this is the one that I remembered us talking about. You know, you got a comedy star. Um, mm. He's on the poster making this expression. Mm. Can like, you, oh, uh, boy. Can you, for the, for the listener at home, maybe describe what I'm doing? He's kind of... He looks nonplussed. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm holding my hands out, holding my hands out. What am I supposed to do here? Uh, he's exactly. He's um, he's 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 a comedy star that we all know and love. He has a job that some might consider uh, an untrustworthy profession. Interesting. Okay, is this a lawyer movie? No, and in fact, the job oh, he has. Oh, I remember this coming up. Okay, okay. Is this that Joe Pesci movie? No, it's not Joe Pesci. The job this Fuck. character has is a, a job that Robert Zemeckis made a movie about. We actually talked about it already. Oh, it's Cadillac Man? It's Cadillac Man. Ooh, Robin Williams. Robin Williams is Cadillac Tim Man. Robbins. Fran Drescher. The trio. Wow. We love them. If you can't trust a car salesman, who can you trust? That is the tagline to Cadillac wow. Man, a movie about a used car salesman played by Robin Williams that I have never seen. Have either of you seen Cadillac Man? I have not. I have. It's good. <laughs> I believe you. Tim Robbins like is like robbing the story. Shows up with a gun because him and Fran Dresser are dating and they like broke up. And then Robin Williams is exposed to be a real scumbag. I love it. Right. Uh, the I will say the top tagline: If you can't trust a car salesman, who can you trust? Pretty ordinary. The bottom tagline: A comedy about the near death of a salesman. That's kind of funny. Hey, huh? that is fun. Hey, some drama humor, <laughs> some Arthur Miller humor. Um, I like it. Number f Go ahead. What were you going to say, Griff? No, I just, I like it. I like it. I approve. I give it some comedy points. Number five at the box office, Griffin, uh, is, a, a, and like, a, you know, I'm, I'm four years old, so I'm not seeing movies yet. You know what I mean? So like, mm -hmm. just uh, these, these Humble things brag. just fly over my head. It's a Disney movie. It's an action film. Uh, it stars one of your favorite actors. Um, I've never heard it, of it. It's a Keaton movie. No, 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 no. Um, but like, since I feel like you tried to watch all the movies this actor was in, maybe you've seen this one. Um, it's not City Steve Martin. Slickers? It's not Bill Murray. It's not City Slickers. It's not <laughs> Steve Martin, Bill Murray. It's not a comedy actor. Although some people think he could be pretty funny sometimes. Oh, oh, it's a Nicolas Cage movie? It is. It's is a it Nicolas guarding Cage Tess? movie. It's not guarding Tess. It's military. It's like, uh, I don't think they're in the military, but like they're flying military uh, equipment. And I think they're having like an adventure in South America. Is it the one with Tommy Lee Jones? Tommy Lee Jones is in it. Sean Young is in it. It's, it's like one of the few Nicolas Cage movies I haven't seen pre direct to video run do you know the name it's called is it called like the yard birds or something it, birds you got birds right yeah it's fire birds right i that was like i was trying to watch all of his movies circa 2000 
10 or whatever it was. And that one was so hard to find. It like doesn't exist. Um, yeah, I, it's maybe it's on Disney Plus. It was a Disney movie. I hope so. I hope it's I hope it's spotlighted. <laughs> I hope they revive it as a Disney Plus series. Weird box office game. Firebirds. I don't know. Wow. Do you know uh, what the tagline is for Firebirds? You want me to tell you the tagline or are you going to tell me? I'm going to tell you. The best just got better. That's it? Hmm. Yep. The best just got better. Cage, Jones, Young. The best just got better. Okay. You know, fine. It feels like you could. <laughs> they had that lying around and they're like, whenever we get stumped by a movie, we'll just yes. throw this on one that we're, we and it'll probably apply. Absolutely, in a tagline pile that could apply to any any movie. Yeah, they're like they're, they're yeah. like the, the guy who wrote the script comes in. And he's like, so it's about like these helicopter pilots, and they go to South America. And the guy's like, Jesus, I got to get to lunch. Look, could you say that with this film, the best got better? And the guy's like, I don't know, I guess so. And he's like, Great, we're gonna do that one. Get out of here. The, the magic is back again. I don't know. Just take something from the drawer. I don't know what to do. The magic was already back. How do I top the magic is back? <laughs> I don't know. Magic is back again. Any tagline in the fridge that doesn't have a name written on it, you can take. Just oh, pull boy. one of them. Uh, ben, I just want to say that number six at the box office this week is a movie we will definitely do as a Ben's choice one day. And we already talked about this franchise. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hell. One. Yeah. The original. The first one. The first one. Wow. You've also got The Hunt for Red October. You have Joe mm -hmm. versus the Volcano. Great movie. You got Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. Good movie. Uh, and you have Spaced Invaders, another like... Never seen it. Disney thing I've never heard of. What the fuck is this? It's the director of Angus, my beloved undersung teen comedy. I like Angus. Yeah, you're right. It Angus is. rules. And I tried to watch that movie because I was such a fan of Angus. I was like, what if Patrick Reed Johnson secretly got this beautiful career? And that movie's kind of dog dog shit. <laughs> Fair. What about uh, Baby Days Out? Baby's Day Out, though. Did you do you like that movie? That movie's kind of fun, right? He's a baby. It's kind of fun. Right? It's it's like the highest grossing film in the history of Manila or something. <laughs> Manila is just a city. <laughs> Wait, we're just. I don't know. <laughs> I think we, I, there's Griffin. I swear we've had this conversation before. This is some deja vu. We was absolutely have. For me. <laughs> Yes. Okay. The episode's <laughs> over. Josh, thank you so much for being on the show. Yes, Josh. Thank you. Truly a pleasure. I had so much fun. We Such had a so gentleman. And one of the reasons we abused your kindness and bopped you around the schedule so much is we were just like, he's an ace <laughs> in the hole. When it, wh whatever episode we get him on, he's going to make good. Josh was booked on the first episode of this show. We've just been fucking <laughs> him over for six years. Books <laughs> to talk about the first 10 minutes of The Phantom Menace. <laughs> right. That's what it was. <laughs> It was the real kind of Jimmy Kimmel, Matt Damon kind of bit we've had going right. that no one knew about. <laughs> no, this was so fun. I and I'm I so appreciate you you having me on. Thank you. Uh, of course, I'm Come a fan a time. fan of the show as I mentioned. Incredible. Uh, people should watch uh, Jesus and Mero, which rules. Absolutely, they're the best. He, they are. They're the so best. funny. Um, and people should rate, review, and subscribe and go to blankies.riot.com for some real nerdy shit. Check out our Shopify page for some real nerdy merch. Uh, go over to our uh, Patreon, uh, patreon.com backslash Belankacheka, uh, where we're talking about the Alien franchise and uh, doing some other fun stuff. Uh, thanks to Andrew Gudo for social media help make this show run. Thanks to Lee Montgomery for our theme song, Joe Bowen, Pat Rounds for our artwork. Tune in next week for Death Becomes Her. Yep. And as always, Baby's Day Out was the most successful film in Calcutta. Calcutta, okay. <laughs> it right. was big in India, but specifically in Calcutta, it played okay. at the largest it theater for over a year, and they said... That Baby's Day Out was more successful than Star Wars. That's, I mean, than Stomp? Star Wars. It's Saw? a very. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Stomp? No, that I was like, weird rubric, but I don't know what, what American culture ports to India. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've, I just, I know the episode's over. I've just discovered something I have to share. Go ahead. Please. Baby's Day Out was remade. <laughs> sure. Under the title, Sisindri. 
And then there was a Malaysian remake of that remake titled James Bond. <laughs> 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 no, that can't be real. <laughs> yes, you're right. James Bond. They just called it James Bond. James Bond. Plot description. Following the bankruptcy of their local business, five friends go into hiding only to stumble upon a baby who changes their lives. <laughs> Sounds like in the remakes, a lot changed. There was a lot going on. <laughs> it's no character thing. named James Bond in this cast. With with the podcast long over, may I put in a tiny plug for my podcast as of well? Course. Oh, please. It's a great time uh, to do that with the podcast being over because I'm bad as being a host. I didn't ask That's you. No, no, no problem. I, I just, I didn't mean to force it, but I was like, as long as we're, we're doing little stuff at the end. Um, it's called Make My Day. It's a comedy game show with one uh, guest every week who's the only contestant. So they're guaranteed to win. <laughs> and at the end, they win a $100 donation to the charity of their choice. That's all. It's great. Thank you. That's why you're the nicest guy on the internet, because you actually put work into making people feel better. Okay, so we said it, Josh. <laughs> you can put the gun down. You can call off your yeah, guard. The I'm pointing a gun, gun at the down. Zoom call. For like two hours and 15 minutes. We've all had Jesus lasers Christ. pointed at our chests this entire time. <laughs> yeah, separately, I've got a lot of laser guys. Unbelievable. Unbelievable.